All right, I think now we can get started. Let me share my screen. All right, so welcome to uh, the tutorial on federated learning in biomedicine. Um, yeah, who are we? We are uh, four um, PhD students who are soon finishing um, and we did our PhD mostly on federated learning and we were also developing a federated learning platform which we will, among other things, introduce in this tutorial. Uh, the first half of the tutorial will be um, about um, theory basically, so um, federated learning by biomedicine in general, uh, what are the, the caveats, um, what are the differences between different types of machine learning methods in, in terms of how they can be federated. Um, and then the second part will be privacy enhancing techniques um, about which Niklas Probul will tell us about. Um, the tutorial objectives are firstly, of course, to introduce federated uh, uh, learning methods, um, what their disadvantages and advantages are, particularly in comparison to their central, um, um, yeah, so their central versions. We also want to raise awareness on uh, data privacy um, and show a couple of privacy enhancing techniques, because as you will see, federated learning alone, not always already does the job in terms of um, maintaining um, patient privacy, for example. And then the second part, I already um, talked about it, is about providing hands-on experience. So you will actually um, develop um, a federated method for yourself and then also run it together with others. All right, in between we have a short coffee break and uh, yeah, I hope we can, we can solve all technical problems um, that some of you um, are having in, in the coffee break. Worst case, we will then have to dedicate a couple of minutes of the um, first slot after the coffee break to that. All right, then let's get started with uh, the introduction part on federated learning. So um, as you most certainly know, machine learning allows for different uh, um, tasks, basically. What we are concerned with here is classification and prediction, so supervised machine learning, but there are, of course, also other types uh, like unsupervised machine, machine learning, such as clustering or um, dimensionality reduction, um, uh, amongst others. But um, in this tutorial, we'll, we will be focusing on um, supervised machine learning, meaning that we have training data that contains um, features and labels. And the task then is to, to predict um, the labels on previously unseen data. Uh, generally speaking, uh, machine learning benefits um, from larger quantities of data, provided, of course, um, that it is high quality data. So if we have um, basically noisy data or low quality data, um, it will not be of much help, but generally you can say the more data you have, the better. And fortunately, the amount of data is growing in, in all sorts of domains um, and particularly in biomedicine because it has become uh, cheaper and cheaper to acquire um, biomedical data like um, sequencing or um, gene expression data and so on. Um, in the classical approach, what we do is um, once different hospitals um, who, for example, um, were part of a, of a study, a large scale study, um, they all collect their data and at the end they share this data with one central um, institution or hospital that's in charge of doing the machine learning. Um, so we merge the data into a big data set and then perform a classical machine learning method on the whole set. And then once we're done with the training, we can share the models again with all those who contributed data. Um, so that would be the classical approach. But unfortunately, um, there are some problems attached to that. We, we cannot simply share private um, data or, or patient data, at least not without um, big legal efforts. So there's a lot of paperwork involved because you need to prove that you have patient consent, patients in most cases also have to um, retain control of the data. So for example, they must be able to revoke consent at a later point and so on. So this um, poses some, some problems here. 
and therefore it's not that easy to do central machine learning. And the idea, therefore, is to do federated machine learning instead. So what we do here is the data remains where it has been collected, so inside the hospitals. And we do not perform the training of one central model on the whole data set in, in one go, but we split the training between um, basically two phases of training. One would be the local training part and then the global aggregation part. Um, so these two words, local and global, will occur often today. So when we say local, we are always referring to um, what's going on inside one hospital, one so basically one data holders site. And when we, when we say global, then we mean some central part, some central institution, also in a technical sense, some central component that then is in charge of aggregating the local parts. Um, yeah, and this we, we could put it like that. So in, we bring the model training to the data, not the other way around, right? So in the classical approach, you bring the data to the model training and this, and here in federated learning, we do it the other way around. Here you can see an, an easy example. Um, so this would be um, a linear regression model now with four hospitals, so four sites. Um, each color represents one site. So we have these colored dots here. To the left, we have basically the central approach. And as you can see, um, when we have all the data in one place, we can easily create this uh, linear model. So the thick blue line um, represents the global model. Um, but of course, this would be the central approach. And in, in the federated setting, what we do instead is we create local versions of this model. So four different local linear models. and we only share these local models and not the, the, the raw, raw data. And we end up in this case with the same global model. So when I say in this case, I mean in case of linear uh, regression, because here it's actually possible to obtain the very same model um, without sharing raw data. As you'll see later, this is not possible with all methods, um, particularly when there are are imbalances in the data. It uh, can be quite challenging to uh, obtain good, re, uh, good global models. But in the case of a, um, um, of a linear um, regression, um, this is possible to have the very same result. So as you can imagine, um, performing such a federated um, machine learning training um, process is much more challenging than doing doing it in a centralized fashion because you have multiple machines involved you have a much more complex system you have network communication going on um, and so on and so on so this this is much more difficult than just performing um, um, one machine or running a machine learning script on your local machine and that's why federated learning platforms um, have become more important because they try to remove this additional effort from the developers, for example, in terms of testing and debugging, but also in terms of isolating um, um, the apps so that they can be run safely inside the hospitals without granting them access to um, sensitive um, infrastructure. And they also um, take care of the network communication. Now, what's the price? So are there any disadvantages? Um, in compared to central uh, machine learning? And the answer is, yeah, there, there is, for example, loss of performance due to communication overhead, of course. So obviously, when we need to send around um, data and possibly in multiple iterations, because not we will not always converge after one iteration. And if each iteration involves uh, network traffic, this, of course, delays the whole um, uh, computation process. We, in many cases have a loss of accuracy. So when I say loss of performance, I mean uh, computational performance here. Loss of accuracy, this relates now to the, the actual prediction performance of, of the model. And this also suffers in many cases because it's more difficult to generalize, of course, if you can only, um, if you can only see the local models and not the whole um, data, basically. And and this is actually of high practical um, importance. So we have less control over the data quality. So you have to rely on each hospital to really follow 
um, the instructions in terms of pre-processing the data, selecting the data, labeling the data correctly, and so on and so on. If you have a centralized way of doing this, of course, it's easy to harmonize the data. If it remains in the, in the federated uh, um, way, then it's much more difficult. And that obviously affects then also the quality of the, of the, of the model. The second question is, is federated learning privacy preserving? And, and the answer is actually tricky because we cannot automatically or generally say that um, a, um, a federated um, machine learning method is per se privacy preserving. It depends very much on the, on the method and on the data. And unfortunately, privacy leaks can still occur. For example, if you're using a model that is prone to overfitting, such as neural networks or um, random forests um, or decision trees or things like that, they unfortunately can incorporate whole parts of the training data and um, thereby reveal sensitive information about the data. But of course, it's, it's still much, much better than sharing the raw data. And the good news is that we can enhance federated learning with additional techniques that go well with, with, with that method or with the technique. And among these techniques are differential privacy and secure multi-party computation or homomorphic encryption, each of which, of course, have their own advantages and disadvantages again. But you'll learn about that in more detail um, in the talk after, after this one. Now let's have a quick look at an actual application example from biomedicine, so GVAS. Um, GVAS stands for Genome-Wide Association Studies, where we try to, to find uh, SNPs, um, so, so parts of the, of the genome, basically, um, that somehow um, yeah, f f affect whether someone um, will have a certain disease or not. So can we find some um, correlation there? And in, in GVAS, what we do is we examine each SNP individually and um, perform basically a logistic regression, for example. And then we can find um, SNPs that are related to, to a disease. And what we do, of course, is we have a case in the control group. And as you can see here in the case group, um, we have a clear prevalence or a, a, clear, a higher occurrence of this version of the, of the SNP than in the control group. And so people have been doing this for quite a while and quite successfully, actually. So this, this was one of the first things that you could do, of course, when, once you had the genome sequenced. Um, and the question is now, can we do this in a federated uh, uh, way? Because obviously, um, we do not want to um, share this, this very sensitive information. So um, genome data is identifying information, so we clearly cannot uh, easily share it. So can we do this in a federated way? So can we do a logistic regression on, on this data in a federated way? And, and that's basically what we did as one of the first um, examples. And um, the, the tool we created contains three types of association tests. Um, so chi-square, linear regression, and logistic regression. And um, yeah, what you can then find are the, the so-called p-values and plot them in a, a Manhattan plot. And then, for example, you see spikes here. And these then would be SNPs that are worth um, taking a look at. And the architecture we we chose, so this is a, a standalone um, tool right now. It's not running on any federated platform. It is a, a standalone tool um, and served basically as a proof of concept. Um, and as you can see, it's it's quite a complex workflow. So someone has to initiate a study. Then you have to invite other uh, participants to that study who then have to join. And they uh, have their own IT infrastructure, of course, um, with their own operating systems and so on. So it has to run on different um, um, architectures. Um, then you can start with sending around the global parameters. You collect the local parameters. And in case of linear regression, you, you're then already done. In, term, in case of logistic regression, you have multiple iterations. And at some point, you then have the results. And as you can imagine, creating such a, such a system and deploying such a system, meaning that you, it has to run somewhere, you need to have a central server and so on, uh, this is quite some effort. Um, so definitely more effort than uh, one central script where you just can run your Plink uh, software or what, 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 whatever you're using. Um, but, and that's the good news, it, it actually works. So um, when you do an, an aggregated analysis, meaning that you um, 
basically collect all the data and then perform your analysis, then of course you obtain good results, but it's not privacy reserving, preserving, but it is robust to imbalance. If you do me so-called meta-analysis, meaning that you perform a whole G GVAS um, or you apply this GVAS tool to your local data and then only share basically the output of that of the tool, you obtain uh, what's called, or you, what you're doing is what's called a meta-analysis. What you obtain is a result that is um, not robust to imbalance, unfortunately, but it is privacy preserving because you did not share any raw data. If you do it in, in, in the federated way, and that's basically now the motivation for this whole um, um, technique, you can basically combine both advantages. It's still privacy preserving and it is robust to imbalance because as a matter of fact, you obtain the very same results as for the aggregated analysis. You can then show this mathematically and empirically, and in here you can just see that the significant SNPs, so SNPs that um, um, surpassed a certain um, threshold, they are the same um, no matter whether you did it in a central way or in a federated way. So yeah, so you can show this, as I said, empirically as we, as we did here, but you can also, of course, show it mathematically. Other examples or other tools we created were uh, Flimmer and Party. So these are um, federated versions of, um, for example, the Lima Voom pipeline, which can be used to do differential expression analyses um, or um, a time to event um, studies tool called Party, with which you can do, for example, um, survival analysis and, and things like that in a federated fashion. Um, so this should just serve as motivation and as, as proof that, that this works actually. And what of course is, uh, um, is a big step forward in, in, in this whole federated, um, um, federated computation is a platform that, as I, as I already said, removes the additional efforts that, that you have as a developer when you try to develop a federated um, method, particularly deployment and the necessity of a central server of um, some kind of collaboration and join process. So you need to invite other parties and so on. And one, one example that we show, what we'll, we'll be showing and that we'll mo mostly be focusing in this tutorial is Feature Cloud, um, which tries to increase convenience for developers by providing um, testing and, and debugging and deployment capabilities but also from a user perspective. So for example, medical doctors or um, researchers working in, in hospitals and other research institutions, um, they, they should just have the um, certainty that when they use the system, that certain, um, certain restrictions are followed basically. So if I go back to here, um, as soon as you run some, some piece of software on your system, of course, this piece of system is a potential threat and a platform um, for federated learning should try to isolate these apps, these um, apps from third party developers as much as possible and grant them only minimum, minimal access to, to any type of, of um, resource basically, be it network traffic, be it um, file system um, or, or anything else that's required to um, perform the computation. And then finally, of course, um, it would be a nice thing to have a, some kind of community um, of developers, researchers, and patients. Um, these three groups are basically all stakeholders in this um, federated um, machine learning um, approach because um, developers obviously want to have help when they develop methods. So let's see how, how well it goes today later on and you'll, you'll see what, what I mean. Um, so debugging and testing and so on is of course a very important thing. But also researchers, of course, they want to have easy access to um, already developed apps. They do not want to, um, you know, read lengthy instructions how to clone some repository and then install some pip packages and make it somehow run on their system and so on and so on. It should be as convenient and easy as possible. And patients should have a way to, um, to have control over the data, maybe um, select which types of studies um, can be used um, or can they, they want to, to um, provide their data for and so on. All right, so what do these platforms take care of? Um, or in, in, in this case, Feature Cloud. Um, so one is of course app communication. So when you have multiple um, participants um, who are part of a machine learning 
um, or, or which are part of a study using machine learning, using federated machine learning, these parts somehow have to communicate. And there are different types of communication um, that you can think of. The classical um, approach in federated machine learning is star-based communication, where you have one central party, um, usually called an aggregator um, or coordinator, and this party collects um, local models from the other participants, who are sometimes called slaves, sometimes called clients, sometimes called participants, um, and they basically contribute local models that have been trained on their local data. Once and once this global model has been aggregated by the uh, central instance, it can be broadcast back to all other participants so that they can train another round. And then it's collected again, aggregated again, broadcast again, and so on and so on. And this can go for a couple of iterations until um, we are satisfied, until we reach some kind of convergence. convergence. So this would be one type of communication. Another would be peer-to-peer. -peer. This is, of course, the most flexible one where um, you're not restricted in any way in terms of who can talk to whom. This is technically a little more challenging because usually you would want to avoid, um, for example, opening ports in, in a hospital. So if, if each client has to serve as a, as a client and a server at the same time, this might be um, difficult. In some cases, not even possible. Um, due to the setup and due to the restrictions of the IT um, infrastructure in the, in the hospitals. But the good thing is that, as you'll see um, on the next slide, we can kind of emulate this peer-to-peer -peer communication in a, in a central uh, architecture as well, using encryption and, and, and so on. So logically, we then are dealing with peer-to-peer -peer communication, but technically, it's still going through one central instance. And then um, there's secure multi-party computation that I already mentioned in, in the context of um, privacy preserving techniques. And this is also a certain type of communication because um, it requires um, peers to exchange a couple of things and actively hiding them from the central instance um, in order to achieve um, um, this, this level of security that we want um, in order to protect the local models and not reveal them to anyone. Yeah, so this is basically an illustration how uh, the star-based communication looks. We have uh, the, the first load phase where each participant just loads the data sets and starts with maybe the first um, 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 training iteration. Then we have a broadcast where we send the models to, to the individual participants. Then we have the gather phase where these local models are sent back to the coordinator and then we start over. And at the end, um, we assemble all the models again and send them back to the participants. Now, how can we achieve peer-to-peer -peer communication in the central architecture? Um, using asymmetric um, encryption, basically. So we have a public key and a private key. And uh, each participant um, sends, around the, uh, uh, sends around their public key so that each other participant can now encrypt um, uh, a message that is designated for, 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 for another participant with exactly that public key. So no one else can read it but that participant who owns the private key. right? So even though it goes through the relay server, so one central server, um, it's still hidden from the other participants. And the relay, sorry, it's still hidden from the relay server because um, the relay server will only see basically random or what looks to, to the relay server random bytes. It cannot decrypt them. So that, that's how we can achieve peer-to-peer -peer communication in a central architecture. Um, now let's have a look at uh, continuous versus discrete models. So um, yeah, this is one distinction that you can make broadly between, between different types of um, machine learning methods. So continuous um, machine learning is um, everything like linear regression, logistic regression, um, neural networks. So basically, everything where a slight and small change to the training data triggers a small and slight change to the model that you obtain, right? So if you if you slightly modify one of the of the of the data points and that you use for training, then the model that you end up with is also slightly affected by it. Whereas for discrete models, a slight change in the data can cause an entirely different model. It can look entirely differently. 
Um, and an examples for discrete models would be, for example, decision trees, right? Because here you have really discrete distinctions uh, in terms of which feature do you take um, at what point to um, um, yeah, basically predict um, a label. And here you do a slight change in the data can really lead to a totally different model. And generally speaking, continuous models um, are easier to federate um, because in the simplest case, what you do is just federated averaging. So you, you really just take the, the, the model vectors. So in case of neural networks, that would be the model weights. In terms of uh, linear regression, this would be um, um, the, the individual components of your, of, your, of, your, of your linear model and just average them using um, a mean, basically. And usually you weight it, of course, um, by the sample size. So a model that has been trained on a lot of data points will have a bigger impact than a model being trained on just a couple of data points. But in the end, it's just average. Um, or in case of neural networks and also other um, machine learning methods, like, for example, linear um, support vector machines, you can also federate the gradient descent, right? So um, there are different options here. And this involves sometimes just one iteration or multiple iterations until you converge. Um, whereas in this, in the discrete setting, in, it's much more difficult to really federate it. In case of um, decision trees, for example, you'd have to grow the decision tree collectively. So for each um, um, branch, basically, you, you'd have to have some kind of agreement between the participants and this is also tricky then when you think of data privacy because you do not want to reveal individual samples if, if possible and so on. Um, so this is a little difficult. It's a little more difficult. What you can always do, of course, is um, applying ensemble techniques. So you just keep the local models and put them all together in, in, in one bigger ensemble and then just do a consensus decision. So that would be a very straightforward uh, way of federating a, a random forest for example, because you already have um, the individual decision trees anyways. So you just share these uh, decision trees and um, assemble them into one big random uh, uh, forest. And you have your federated random forest. And that also works surprisingly well, actually. So um, if you're interested in, in random forest, for example, you can have a look at this, this paper where we um, yeah, tried it out with different types of data. and. Um, use this naive approach, basically, of creating a federated uh, random forest. All right, now let's finally um, have a look at um, some evaluations. Um, so here we compared two different types of um, machine learning methods, a discrete one and a continuous one, if you will, so logistic regression and random forest. In the case of logistic regression, as you can see, we achieved the very same results, um, no matter if we train it in a centralized fashion or a federated fashion. I mean, this is not overly surprising if you think of the one of the first slides you've seen, um, because you can actually obtain the very same model. So we, of course, also achieved the very same result. Um, whereas the individual models are performing worse, so meaning that if you, of course, only train, train them on a split of the data and then apply them or evaluate them on the whole data set, you obviously have a worse performance. So that's what's meant by um, individual central test data, meaning that they have been trained on local data, so on a part of the um, whole data set, but evaluated on the central test data. And individual local test data means they have been trained and evaluated on the local test data. And not surprising, the local evaluation then is, again, slightly better because it's basically this, it has the same kind of bias, for example, that you have. So we, you might have local biases um, that then um, are better predicted by uh, the, the local model on the local data than on the central data. Right, for random forests, um, it's different. We do not um, obtain the same result. Um, so in, interestingly, we in this case even have uh, sometimes a better result, right? Even though we have uh, here a very bad sample. Um, so this depends hugely then, of course, on how biased is your data set. Do you have non-identically distributed data and so on? In this case, we had identically distributed data. That's why it performed comparatively well. Um, so to the, yeah. 
to the left, we um, were looking at accuracy on the ILPT. So this is the Indian liver patient data set, the public data set that you can you find, find online. To the right, we have um, a breast cancer uh, data set. Um, yes, but in both cases, it was a uh, classification basically that has been done. Now, in terms of runtime, we um, can obtain some interesting results because um, in case of random forests, when we want to have the same global random forest, meaning that we have the same number of trees in the random forest, that means that each participant has to contribute fewer trees, meaning that if you have more participants, um, they each have to do less, <laughs> which leads to a decrease in runtime even because the individual training rounds for, in, for the individual participants um, is done faster. And that's why we have this decrease in, in runtime even. Um, so the, the um, top chart sh shows a random forest, the low one is uh, logistic regression. Um, to the left, you see the runtime, to the right, you see the traffic that has been transmitted. And as you can see also the traffic, of course, decreases then if you have to transmit fewer trees. In case of logistic regression, we have no changes in, in terms of runtime because um, the, the model size is always the same. So each participant has to send exactly the same amount of data. Of course, for very, very high numbers of participants, we'd expect the central aggregating party to be the bottleneck. And then, of course, we would have some, some uh, decrease in, in terms of, of uh, runtime or, or increase in terms of runtime, rather. Uh, but for a, a low number of participants, you, you will not see any, um, any such effect. Yes, maybe, maybe I should mention in this context that um, in, in biomedicine and in, in, in the cases we're um, looking at today, we usually have just a couple of participants. So we do not have like thousands or, or, or tens of thousands or even millions of participants like you have um, in cross-device federated learning, right? So we, we are dealing with cross-silo uh, federated learning here. So our number of participants will always be um, in the two digits uh, numbers max, right? Sometimes even below. Okay, this was a brief introduction to uh, federated learning in general. So if we're, we now have about 10 minutes for your questions and are well at, in schedule. So if you have any, please ask away. I believe you need to use the, not Italy show, but I believe you need to use the chat feature for questions, unless you figure out how you can say something. So one question would be, what is the, uh, that's just been asked in the chat, what is the class of models for which federated learning gives you the same model as training on the full data set at once? So I guess by at once, um, here it's meant like in one iteration, in one go. Right. Um, so the machine learning method I'm aware of is a linear regression where this is actually possible. Um, so generally speaking, um, if you have multiple iterations in the centralized version, you obviously also have multiple iterations in the federated version. You will not be able to do it in one go and also not by just doing one um, training phase locally involving multiple iterations and then just assembling them. So in case you have multiple iterations in, in, on, in, in your centralized version, you will also have to have multiple exchanges in the federated setting. So actually exchanges between, between the, the individual partners. If you can do it in one go in the centralized um, version and it's a continuous model, chances are high that you can actually do it in one go in the federated setting as well. So it has to be a continuous mo model for sure. 
is, is it a satisfactory answer? Please feel free to, um, to ask again. Or maybe also provide some classes of machine learning methods if you. OK. All right. Maybe I can also add a comment here. Maybe turning around this question is a bit uh, more easy to explain for which models it doesn't work. So where can we not get the same results as the centralized model? And this is definitely the case for these ensemble methods if we only use this naive aggregation approach. Because then, like for example, in a random forest, each site trains its own random forest on their own data. And if you merge all the forests together, um, this will never result in the same uh, same global random forest if, if you would train on a centralized data set. It can still achieve a high accuracy or a comparable accuracy, but it won't be the, the same model in the end. Yep. So we have another question. Um, a different angle on this question. Can you evaluate variable importance in federated learning? And would your indicators be similarly ranked to what you would have in a centralized approach? Um, yes, you can. Um, you can do that. So um, obviously, models that do, do uh, provide you with some kind of ranking, um, like, for example, you could look at the individual um, parts of a li linear model at the individual components. And you can use them as an indicator as well. So um, I mean, if you, you could look at it in a slightly different way, if you obtain the same model and the model is suited um, to obtain um, a ranking of variables, then you can also use this very same model that you've obtained uh, from federated learning to do the same thing. All right, more questions? All right, I mean, we will also have the opportunity uh, after each talk basically to talk about different things. It doesn't have to be strictly separated by the respective uh, topics of the talk, but um, I would suggest, Niklas, if you sure. want, you uh, can start away. With the next one. Can you hear me? <clears throat> Julian, can you can you hear me? You can. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Great. Okay. Very nice. So I'm gonna steal the screen share from you. Another question came in. Okay. Okay. We do that. <clears throat> um, so the question is about non-IID data, and are they a problem even with a continuous model like a neural network? Yeah. So generally speaking, non-IID data is one of the biggest problems of federated learning, and um, you can still obtain the same model. Usually, it takes much longer. So that so if you if time is not a concern to you and you can really wait until it converges um, for as long as you like, then non-IID data uh, can be dealt with. But I believe Muhammad, if you're in the line, you can um, add something here because. Something dealing with a lot. Yes, uh, sure. Uh, federated learning has some challenges, uh, and community is working on it. And uh, one of those challenges is uh, dealing with heterogeneous data, uh, non-ID data, and uh, it depends on the develop level of uh, data, level of the uh, data heterogeneity. But practically, with uh, if almost too many, uh, too too many. Uh, communication runs, uh, you can get the uh, results of the centralized training, even with data heterogeneity. All right, thanks. Exactly. So just in the extreme case, right, you would have labels of only one sort at one hospital and only labels of the other sort in the other hospital. And this, of course, it cannot get worse than that. And even if this case, um, it, it would be possible, but it takes very long, a very long time. Okay, so now, Niklas, I think you can. Great, thanks a lot. Um, 
Okay, so I think you can see it. Julie, maybe you have to uh, stop your screen share, I believe. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I think there are two. Yeah, nice. That looks good. So great. Um, thanks for the for the nice introduction to federated learning, Julian. Um, so we're now going to talk a little bit about uh, privacy enhancing techniques. Um, first, a small caveat, right? Um, we're still bioinformaticians uh, at heart, so we're not uh, um, hardcore cracks in uh, in IT security. So uh, please, uh, please. Um, uh, as I'm saying, I'm saying sorry for all the small mistakes that are maybe happening uh, in this presentation. Great. So uh, what are we going to talk today? Um, first, why do we need privacy enhancing techniques? Um, Julian already talked about this a little bit. Um, then we're going to look at some outdated approaches, uh, especially KN limited sorts. And then we're going to give uh, a short roundhouse talk about all the different topics that we're uh, um, usually using in federated learning, and at the end, we're going to summarize it all. So why use privacy enhancing techniques? Um, the first thing is Julian already touched about um, general data privacy is a, is a huge thing right now. Um, it always has been, but uh, it has become even bigger in the recent years, right? There were um, um, there are a few um, rather new laws, for example, the General Data Protection Regulation in Europe, the GDPR, that makes it even harder to, to share data, um, which makes sense at some point, right? Um, but um, also has some, uh, put up some more hurdles to, to um, get over to, uh, to do some science, right? Um, for example, uh, uh, if there are two university hospitals, at least in Germany, it's like this um, in the same city, right? They have uh, they have uh, great difficulty working together and sharing data, even if they are right next to each other, right? Um, and the other thing um, that we need to take care of um, are uh, the bad guys, right? So a simple picture of a stereotypical hacker everyone uh, everyone uh, thinks of, right? So even if it's not um, leaked by mistake by someone uh, who is uh, not uh, following the um, data protection laws, um, if they are, are the bad guys and who actually want to steal your data, um, that also is, is uh, a threat we have to tackle. Um, and also maybe um, uh, just think about, I don't know, your social or your, your health insurance company having access to your health record data and your uh, genomics data, right? There are some uh, markers that uh, could drive up the prices of your health insurance quite quite uh, rapidly, right? So um, we don't we don't want this. We want uh, data privacy in general. So first, outdated approaches. Um, the simplest way to not um, leak uh, private data from your database is to not have private data in your database, right? So for example, the um, let's look at the very um, a very ad, uh, a very uh, much identifying data point, your name, right? If we just remove the name um, through suppression, we de-identify um, the data and uh, now you no, no longer can leak it, right? But there are, uh, turns out not only your name is identifying you, there are a lot of other things in the database that could identify you, right? For example, your age. So you could also use um, generalization, for example. This means um, we remove uh, specific values. If you look at the first row, we can see we remove the 46, um, the specific age, and replace it by a, a range. In this case, 41 to 50, which makes sense, right? Um, now you can no longer see, um, uh, now you can no longer identify the first row, right? No, wrong. Um, despite uh, being, um, so more generalized, we can still see. Okay, there's only one um, one person in this in this table that is uh, not in the range 21 to 30. So despite not uh, stating the the real age or the specific age, we still have the issue um, that you can clearly identify um, the person uh, the person um, uh, uh, in the first row. Right. There are also some other ways to do this. Um, some people like to do it like this. So you just uh, add some stars, which uh, basically does the same thing, but uh, looks a little bit different. So those are things you come across. Um, and if you want to formalize this problems, uh, th this this problem and this approach, um, we can we arrive at something called k-anonymity, 
and formally can say that the data set D satisfies K anonymity for a value of K if for each row um, there exists at least K minus one other rows that uh, um, their products sum up to each other. So what does this mean? Um, basically, this means if you want a K anonymity of two, and uh, you select one row of your data, you want at least one other row. So K is two, so two minus one, as we can see in the formula, um, two minus one, so one other row that is not distinguishable in any of the quasi identifiers. So if we go back a slide and we can see, okay, for example, let's look at um, line four, the last one. Um, if we were to look at age, um, here we have at least um, two other people, in this case, even three other people that have the same age bracket, 21 to 30. In this case, we have some more problems, right? Because of the because of the uh, sex and the disease, it's not K, anon K anonymous, but this is what the um, intuition is for this. And what, import is, what is important here um, is that this uh, aims for quasi identifiers. So this assumes that there are more and less important values in the data, right? The most important probably being like your name, your address, things that uh, will, lead, uh, will will make it very easy to uh, for people to find you directly, right? Go to your house, but even things like um, your, your age, your uh, BMI, height, um, gender diseases and so on. So all the covari uh, covariates you actually want um, in a scientific analysis will also um, be pretty uh, identifiable. Um, so, uh, so what's the issue then, right? Just just to remove the important parts um, and like the quasi identifiers, and then you're good, right? Uh, not so much. Um, turns out um, uh, there's a great example for this. Um, so uh, please excuse the full slide. Um, in 2006, Netflix. Um, had uh, offered a challenge. They offered $1 million uh, in a movie recommendation challenge. In this challenge, they collected um, 100 million movie ratings of 500,000 Netflix uh, subscribers from the past few years and uh, wanted uh, people to um, actually improve the, the movie recommendation um, algorithm they had, right? So they had movie ratings for a bunch of Netflix subscribers, not important, right? Um, and in the FAQ, uh, there was a question, is there any customer information in the data set that should be kept private? And Netflix confidently answered, no, of course not. It's just movie recommendations, right? Any identifying things like name, age, location, so on has been removed. So even um, if they knew all your ratings, they were sure you couldn't uh, even identify them. So even if you knew a person's, uh, all of the person's ratings, you couldn't even identify uh, the person. So um, as it is with things like that, um, there is always always someone who who uh, spoils the day, right? Um, so there was, was a great uh, paper in 2008, and they basically came up with a small algorithm. They had the dataset X, which is our Netflix dataset, so a set of records, um, the Netflix ratings. And now they use something else um, as an attacker here called the adversary. They have X prime, which is a subset of X possibly distorted. So they don't even need the full data set. And then they need something they call AUEX. So aux, auxiliary, auxiliary information, which basically means they need some more data, right? Um, so uh, if we're talking about movie ratings, what data did they pick? Um, they went to IMDB, which is a public movie. Um, database and they just um, took this movie ratings database as uh, um, as auxiliary information right and what are the goals they want to output um, so they want to throw in a uh, an imdb user and find out if he's in the data set so in netflix data set this is what uh, this is what they tried to do and they came up with this small um, formula right so you sum up over all the IMDb ratings, the similarity of the rating and the date um, of a movie, um, and you weigh it by the popularity of the movie and you downweigh popular movies, right? Um, and then they just sampled 50 IMDb users and just like that, they identified two users in the Netflix dataset. 
Um, not a big deal, right? Um, because I mean, it's just it's just a, a movie database. But um, if you can do this with movie database, if you have some more really personal data, um, for example, parts of the genome or or, or the sorts, um, it's really easy to identify um, people, and then the consequences are a little bit higher. Um, than just someone leaking all your your uh, movie ratings and your very bad taste in, in movies. Um, and this all, everything ended in a class action lawsuit against Netflix um, and they settled all of, uh, out of court for an undisclosed, amo undisclosed amount. I would be very interested in knowing how much this actually was. Um, and there was no Netflix challenge two and there also was no Netflix challenge three, right? Um, so uh, they quickly realized that even um, features that are that don't seem important can be identifying very, very quickly. So uh, we can deduce from this that every feature in a data set can be a quasi-identifier. And um, while it is uh, probably not possible to identify um, every user um, with an approach like this, um, you will always get a few, right? If the number is large enough, um, no, matter, no matter how bad your approach is, you will definitely get a few. And if you really try and you um, really put some effort, effort into it, you can probably identify a large amount of, of users using, for example, this approach. So a very, very easy approach or straightforward approach. So, um, but hey, uh, we have improved, right? Time time passed on, and we have some better working um, methods to identify, uh, to de-anonymize or secure your data. And uh, in this case, we are uh, so in this presentation, we are mostly going to talk about homomorphic encryption, secure multi-party computation, differential privacy. Um, yeah, federated learning has been covered before, right? But we will also circle back to this a little bit. So let's start at differential privacy because it's actually very similar to k anonymity, at least um, what it wants to do. So let's say um, you have a, um, a database, same information as before, right? Age, height, sex, disease, and so on. And you have some sort of mechanism that um, basically is a querying tool, right? So some people can ask questions and receive answers. Uh, in this case, it's uh, very happy, very well-meaning data scientists who would never think of doing anything bad, right? Um, and they can ask many questions and get many answers. So, um, but what happens now? Um, so the difficulty of differential privacy is that the effect of an individual should be hidden. What this means is um, if, there's a, if there's a bad guy, um, he shouldn't be able to tell if one person's data was removed or changed in an arbitrary way, right? So if you ask a question, um, and he will get, will get an answer, and if a day later he will ask uh, a different, uh, the same question, and in this day, I don't know, someone was removed from the database, um, some data changed, and now you, um, whenever you got cured, I don't know, um, you aged a day, um, then he will receive the exact same answer, and you shouldn't, he shouldn't be able to. Um, tell that there was a change in the database. So, if you mark it like this, right, we remove the one one set of the, one data set, uh, one one data sample, and put an arbitrarily different different data sample, and it's still the same answers he gets. Um, the thing is, uh, this is just for one query, right? So, um, we use something called output perturbation. Um, he asks a question. We now ask the question, what fraction of people are male and have disease, as we have, have the, are, are positive in disease, right? We throw this into the mechanism, and the mechanism puts out the answer plus some noise, so we can't um, see if we get uh, uh, if some, something changed in the database. And the good thing is we, we need very, very little noise um, as the number of entries um, goes towards infinity. Um, so, uh, that's actually a great thing because noise is always bad when you do some analysis. And there are, especially if you do iterative processes, noise can quickly add up and lead to very skewed results. So um, what's the issue here? Yeah, this is just for one query. So um, if you have an attacker, you have an adversary, someone who wants to get uh, information out of your data set, um, he's not going to just ask one question and be uh, as happy with the results, right? Um, if he is, then you probably have other issues, but uh, um, what happens if he uh, if he wants uh, if you want protection from more than than one query, right? So 
Um, for this, there's something called the Laplace mechanism. So here is again some some formalities, right? Um, we call something epsilon differential private um, if we if this uh, fulfills the uh, the equation f of x big f of x is f of x plus Laplace s divided by epsilon, where um, s is the sensitivity of f, so your um, mechanism, and epsilon um, is your Laplace function. So uh, is your is your uh, privacy um, your privacy uh, variable, right? So um, the the amount of privacy you want to put into the whole system. Um, and you can see a Laplace function looks something like this, I put it down the right. Um, this is not really important for the, uh, the details are not really important for the for the mechanism. What this means is um, we now can put a measure um, on how many, sorry, we now, we now can uh, do basically the same thing, right? We now not return just some noise, but we return um, uh, the, our Laplace function with our privacy modifier times um, the number of uh, samples we have as noise. And sorry, let me just, okay, great. Yeah, sorry, I thought I skipped the slide. Um, I actually think they got switched around. So um, what is this privacy budget I've been talking about? So what, what is this, this uh, number we can, uh, Put uh, put towards the the amount of privacy we have in the data set. So um, for our mechanism, this e uh, epsilon differentially private for one query. This means if you have so one question. So if you have k queries, um, it's k times your epsilon differentially private, which is nice. But now we because now we can say, hey, um, we actually want um, uh, the privacy for a certain number of queries, and we can guarantee this mathematically, right? So we have um, at most, uh, let's say, a global epsilon. Now we can simply um, divide this global epsilon by the number of um, of uh, of queries we want to receive, and just stop answering, uh, stop answering after that amount of queries, right? And this is what we call a budget because you spend it. And now you can actually say how how um, private do you want your data set to be? Do you want to add a lot of noise and make it very private or do you want, just want to add a little noise and make it um, not so private in the sense that you can not ask uh, many queries before the budget runs out. And how this budget is defined um, uh, is a little bit different um, depending on what you actually want, right? Um, yeah, for example, you can um, have a privacy budget that runs out over, let's say, a month. So uh, if you have a database, um, a patient database, um, let's say an arbitrary patient can only sh uh, show up in queries 100 times. And after that, he just vanishes from database, right? He will not get um, put in uh, for additional queries. So you can even get down to individual patients and uh, have individual budgets for each patient. And a typical recommendation for a good privacy guarantee is uh, an epsilon of around 0 0.01 to 1. Um, but if you want to implement this, uh, you will, of course, have to um, take a look into a little bit deeper and not just use, use the standard values when it comes to uh, data security, right? Okay, um, so let's summarize this quickly. Um, what does differential privacy mean? Um, when an adversary learns something about me, he could have learned this from everyone else's data, right? So um, um, if it's a data set from, let's say, uh, a German country, um, and he learns uh, through some measure that, that I'm from Germany, great, um, but he could have learned this from the, everyone else, right? Um, so this is what differential privacy guarantees, that no individual um, patient uh, will leak information about himself. Um, so no leakage in, uh, specific to individuals. And this also holds regardless of computational power. So um, even if Google tries to get some information out of this or someone who has a lot of computational power or someone who has auxiliary information, for example, an IMDb movie database, which will not help in this case, um, this still holds, which is nice because then you can give a guarantee that the data is indeed private. Um, but the other thing is, there's also no guarantee that the adversary won't infer sensitive attributes, right? So um, if I don't want to um, 
uh, I don't know, leaked that I'm from Germany, I shouldn't have uh, agreed that this uh, database can be publicly queried or so on, right? So um, you can get some information um, for, uh, regarding the yourself, you know, by um, uh, learning it from the whole data set, right? Everyone else, but he will not get, again, information that just um, concerns you. And also, um, there's no guarantee that subjects won't be harmed, right? So uh, again, the Germany example, um, he, some guy knows that I'm from Germany, great, like uh, he harmed me, he uh, learned something about me, right? This is what we, we say harm in this case. Great. And also there's no protection for information that is not localized to a few rows. So um, uh, if you are the only patient that actually has the disease, um, yeah. That's yeah. There's there's uh, you need a little, a little bit of noise to actually be able to uh, for this to work. So uh, if you have outliers, um, this can be a problem. Great. Uh, I just saw the uh, the answer in uh, as I saw saw the question in the chat. I will just uh, answer it uh, after the the whole talk. Right. Great. So uh, next, come to uh, let's come to the next. Um, thing you want to look at in this case, secure multi-party computation. So, what is secure multi-party computation? Let's see. Uh, let's say um, there are uh, three random people called uh, Jan, Mohammed, and Nicholas, right? And they each have a salary, and now they want to. They work at the same the same company, company, or let's say the same uh, university, and um, they want to know what the average salary is, right? Um, so now. Um, the simplest way, of course, would uh, be, right, everyone they meet, they each uh, openly tells uh, the others what their, uh, what their salary is, right? And then you could just sum it up, divide it, and so you have the average salary. But uh, I don't know, maybe you don't want to talk about, uh, talk with your coworkers about your average salary, right? Um, if you if you earn more, maybe you don't you want to invite them to a beer every time you go out. Um, so is there a way you can do this without actually sharing your uh, the information, how much you make? Um, to everyone else. So um, this is where secure multi-party computation um, enters the picture, right? Um, and what we do is we uh, split up um, the salary into sh what we call shards, right? So um, what's important here is that all the shards, uh, shards should sum up um, to your to, uh, to your actual salary. So let's look at the first one, Nicholas. Um, uh, he earns fifty thousand a year. Um, and um, his first shot is minus 20, his second shot is zero, and his third shot is uh, 70. So now if we sum it up, we end up at 50. And we do this um, for every uh, every data sample, in our, uh, every, every uh, sample in our data, right? And what we then do is uh, we distribute the shards. So now I hand my first shot, um, uh, sorry, then I hand my, my second chart to Mahmoud, right? Um, and uh, my third chart to Jan. And so uh, everyone has uh, pieces of the information, um, but not the whole picture. And how this works is um, that we now can, um, without knowing what the others actually make, right? We can uh, sum up all the shards we have. And in the end, we get uh, results like uh, my sum would be 80, Muhammad's sum would be 100, and Jan's sum would be 30. And now we can share this number with everyone. And in the end, we would receive um, still the same number as doing it uh, um, the, the straightforward way, everyone sharing their data. Great. Um, so yeah, this was a very short take on home, uh, secure multi-party computation. Um, I will uh, talk about the advantages and disadvantages later. And in the end, uh, homomorphic encryption, right? The, the holy grail of encryption, how they call it sometimes. Um, and this is a uh, um, very easy way to, to phrase this. Um, so uh, let's say you have the raw data that is in the first row. You have um, data piece five and data piece 10. And now you want to actually do something with the data, right? So you can you can do some maths, and now you want to calculate what's five plus ten, and you receive fifteen. Okay, very nice, but not very secure, right? So wouldn't it be cool um, if you can encrypt the data, and now you don't have five and ten, you have x and y, z, and you can still do the same maths with it, right? So it would it would be cool if you could just uh, calculate x plus y and z, and receive a third value in this case uh, p d q. 
and uh, um, you could encrypt this, and in the end, you would also re uh, receive your number 15. So how this would be used, right? So you would encrypt your data locally, you would send it to someone who does the computation, then they would compute it and send it back and you could encrypt it um, and you have your number, right? Um, but turns out this is not an easy problem. If you encrypt your data, um, it's very hard to actually um, use it for, uh, for, for mathematical operations because um, it has to be a very specific um, encryption algorithm. Um, so uh, they actually, in the beginning, they split um, homomorphic encryption into a few subfields, right? We have partial, uh, partially homomorphic encryption, which means there's a limited number of operations you can do. So you can only add um, two values 10 times, for example, and then it doesn't work anymore, right? Um, there is somewhat homomorphic encryption, with, which is a great name, by the way, which means there is a limited range of operations. For example, you can only do additions. You can't multiply. Um, and in the end, um, uh, they reach the point where there's fully homomorphic encryption, which means there's an unlimited range and number of operations. So you can do as many additions and multiplications as you want. Um, great. So in the beginning, this problem is not uh, a very, very uh, young problem. It first came up in uh, the 1980s. Uh, there were some tries to implement this. Um, first, they came up with some uh, different people came up with some partially homomorphic encryption. Um, methods and in the end it actually got to somewhat homomorphic encryption algorithms until in 2009 um, there was this breakthrough um, publication by Gentry um, who came up with the first uh, fully homomorphic encryption scheme and as soon as people learned how to do this right they they um, they noticed that's actually feasible and this is uh, if we actually get to the point where this is usable, um, this would be uh, very, very nice. Um, so there are publications after publications, quite a few, um, everyone making small improvements. Um, but in the end, there's still uh, a quite big problem. So, um, I mean, there are a lot of publications. This seems to be a very active research field, right? So why are we using it? Um, usually it's because of the computational overhead. Um, turns out doing maths, um, with uh, encrypted values is actually quite hard. It's computationally expensive, and it uh, um, takes quite a quite a long time. And it's also hard to implement and optimize. So uh, while there have been um, great improvements until in the last um, 12 years, 12, 13 years, um, we're still not at a point where it's it's very easy to do this, um, especially if we want to do this multiple times and do multiple operations, this will take very, very long. And uh, as we're seeing uh, in a little bit, um, uh, this is not really feasible to use in uh, federated learning without some serious drawbacks. Great. So um, let's summarize. Uh, federated learning, you probably saw this picture before, I'm not really sure. Um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, federated learning, um, uh, as Julian explained, um, a quick catch up, right? Um, we don't need to, to share the data to do some calculations. Every hospital or participation site does the calculations locally and, um, then only shares their um, training or, or their, their learned parameters and so on. This, uh, in this case, it's um, the easiest approach where um, you also talked about that this is um, uh, provable, um, has provable identical results. Um, so in this case, we have a linear regression. Um, we can see that each hospital uh, has their own colored data points. These are the, the small colored, uh, colored dots and they compute one slope. And at the end, they just share the slope parameters and receive uh, a, global, a global model. So each, so local computation, which results, which gets combined to a global model, right? Just a quick catch up because we're gonna talk about uh, a combination of federated learning and uh, privacy enhancing techniques now. So um, I'm going to show you some of those uh, nice spiderweb plots. Um, and they have um, six different metrics. Let's start at the top. Oh, let's start at the top left, actually. Um, first, we have the computational overhead to preserve privacy. So this means um, how, much more calc how much more intensive is the calculation if we want to do this in a privacy-preserving um, way. 
Um, then we have the quality of the results. How accurate are they? This is independent of actually um, what, uh, for example, machine learning or federated learning method we use. So we're not going to compare uh, random forests against logistic regression or something like this, but um, how much the um, method or the privacy enhancing uh, technique influences the, the general performance of the methods in use. Then we're going to talk, uh, then the communication overhead. So how much more communication rounds, for example, do we need? How much larger is the communication if we, um, if we use uh, the privacy enhancing techniques? And also, um, is the, how is the privacy of the exchange traffic? Is, the, um, is it secured? Is it uh, encrypted and so on? And in the end, um, those are all uh, from one to six, uh, rated from one to six. And in the end, we have two um, binary variables. We first have a privacy guarantee. So um, is there an assumptionless guarantee of privacy that is provable, right? Can you actually um, calculate how private your, your transaction will be or do you have to estimate it, right? And at the end, um, last one is there is no sensitive data in the traffic. So um, uh, is there actually, uh, is sensitive data even even transmitted at all, right? So first, um, let's start where we left off, right? Home of encryption. Um, the nice thing is uh, you have uh, a very low impact on accuracy, right? Um, you also have uh, uh, sorry, uh, the other way around. Sorry, um, you also you have very um, efficient communication. Um, since you're basically only sending around encrypted data, um, you have a very high traffic um, privacy since the data is fully encrypted in all times where it is um, uh, transmitted. But um, the uh, costs are that you are usually, um, uh, you have high comp local computational costs, which will slow down um, the uh, the speed tremendously. Uh, tremendously. Um, and you also, in most methods, you also have um, a very high, a very high noise. Um, additionally, the both binary metrics you can't have a privacy guarantee, right? And you also um, actually in exchange um, uh, sensitive um, information. In this case, it's a little bit um, um, mitigated because I mean there are of course the sensitive information you. Um, exchange is actually encrypted, right? So the next one is secure party comp uh, secure multi-party computation, um, which has a very high accuracy, um, which is a very efficient communication, um, which has efficient communications. You have some more communication um, overhead than, than if you would do it like the, the normal way, right? You have to um, basically create a number of shards that you send around. It's not just one value in our case uh, with the salary example. It's suddenly you're sending out three values and then you're even combining them and sending them back. So there's some some overhead, but it's not, not too huge. Um, you also have a uh, high number of privacy, uh, high, high, uh, um, yeah, high number of privacy of the um, a high measure of privacy, let's say, like this, uh, of the exchange traffic, right? Um, the shards themselves are not um, uh, are privacy preserving and are not uh, leaking any information. A shard alone will not help you. Only the the combined sum of the of the shards uh, shards will um, get rid of the uh, will, will will restore the um, uh, the original value. But um, uh, there's also some uh, drawbacks, of course. You first, um, there's a low computational efficiency. You need um, to actually split the shards, and if you have some, uh, if you want to create more shards and so on, uh, this this takes a while, right? You also have to add additional um, calculation steps of splitting the shards and then aggregating them again and so on. And um, also, there's a limited number of operations. Usually, uh, secure multi-party computations only supports um, very basic. Um, very basic uh, uh, operations with often makes uh, which often makes uh, implementation um, differ, uh, difficult. Uh, differential privacy is the last one of the the basic techniques. Um, different, differential privacy is nice because it's um, it's actually quite efficient in computation and communication overhead, right? Um, uh, and also has uh, as one of the uh, as the only technique. Um, 
a privacy guarantee so you can mathematically prove that uh, what you're doing is uh, privacy preserving and you can actually put a number to this you can fine-tune it you can uh, um, change it to the demand of the amount of privacy you actually want from your data um, but of course um, it has uh, um, a low traffic privacy right um, there's no intrinsic encryption in the uh, um, in the answers you receive, right, in, the, in your query answers. And so you probably need to combine this in some way to make this, um, to, to increase the, the uh, traffic privacy. And also because, um, like we said, um, for differential privacy, we add some noise to the data to mask individual um, uh, data samples. Um, and this, of course, introduces noise. So this actually has a, depending on the method, a quite uh, high hit on the accuracy, especially iterative methods um, uh, that are very sensitive to small changes. Um, for example, let's assume like a neural network or something that has many, many, many weights um, and very little uh, um, uh, noise in the weight um, can actually mess up your network uh, quite quickly. So it, uh, if you want to transmit a lot of very sensitive, so uh, sensitive to change data, um, differential privacy can be an issue. Also iterative processes um, offer suffer a great hit in accuracy. And uh, so now what happens if you combine this with, uh, with federated learning, right? Um, federated learning itself is, is great because it has efficient computation. You don't even need to compute um, everything at a single location, right? Because you don't have a single location of data. The data is actually split around. So um, the amount of data processed at, at each location is actually smaller. So the computation is quite, uh, quite efficient. You can achieve um, high accuracy, which is um, at least comparable to the centralized um, the centralized performance of uh, most algorithms. And um, there is no uh, sensitive data in traffic, right? So you're not sending around any sensitive data, you're just sending around parameters. And also uh, the, the small, but, uh, but uh, sometimes uh, um, 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 a very costly uh, drawback is that this is had this, uh, that this, uh, it has inefficient communication, right? Because you know um, need to actually aggregate your models. Um, Julian talked about this. Um, there are uh, different approaches how to do this. Uh, for example, in the star-based approach uh, or the star-based communication, you 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 you, uh, you gather your data and um, you need to aggregate. Uh, a global model to evaluate your performance. Um, and especially if you have iterative processes or iterative learning models, um, uh, there's a lot of network communication um, until it uh, until you are done with your training, right? So uh, if you want to transmit uh, bigger models, um, this can actually uh, lead to some problems. But uh, I mean, since federated learning is only the platform we're using, right? The base technique, we can actually put other privacy enhancing techniques on top of federated learning. So um, what happens when, when we combine federated learning with differential privacy? Um, uh, we actually uh, mask some of the effects. It has um, still efficient communications. It has, uh, which is the, in my opinion, a very, very big point. Uh, it has a privacy guarantee still, right? You can mathematically, um, proof that your your data is private, and there since there now is no uh, uh, sensitive information in traffic because of the federated learning. Um, but again, um, the communication overhead is still quite big, right? And there is uh, still the high noise problem with federated learning. Um, homomorphic encryption is also uh, a great in combination with federated learning. We have um, only encrypt the traffic, which is nice itself, right? And in this case, we not only have uh, encrypted traffic, but the traffic itself also doesn't even include sensitive data, which makes it uh, very, very secure. Uh, but the the high cost um, is that there is a high communication overhead, and um, the there is a um, that there is a very high uh, there's a high local. Uh, computation cost, right? As we talked about, um, homomorphic encryption uh, often is very slow in, uh, or it demands very uh, it demands many computational resources. And at the end, um, secure multiple computation, which is um, great if you want high accuracy, um, is actually um, uh, quite computationally efficient. Um, 
and because of the federated learning, um, you again have no, uh, you're not, not exchanging any sensitive information, no sensitive data in the traffic. And also, um, since you're using uh, secure multi computation, multi party computation, and you have the, the shards we talked about, there actually is um, uh, the, the privacy of the exchange traffic is, is very high because, as we said, uh, if you talked uh, about before, um, there is no, each shard individually will not uh, leak any private information. But um, the uh, communication overhead here is uh, doubles up, right? You not only have more operations you want to take, right? The the um, the shard on not sending one message, right? But splitting them into shards. But um, this is also um, now coupled with the communication overhead you receive um, when um, using uh, federated learning, which uh, sums up to a very big communication overhead. And um, also the the big point that there are uh, limited operations in most. Uh, and most protocols in use. Great, which makes uh, implementation a little bit harder. Okay, great. Um, so uh, here are they all again, um, and a quick overview. Um, this is basically it, uh, a quick roundhouse kick talk um, uh, for the privacy enhancing techniques we're using or planning to use uh, or are commonly used in federated learning. Great, uh, thanks a lot. And we are now going to uh, answer some questions. Um, there's also the first one in the chat. I'm just going to read it out loud. Regarding the Netflix case, um, did they test whether the additional information they obtained on the identifying users was different from the ones that was public on IMDb anyways? In which case, I'm not sure uh, it's an actual breach of privacy. Because in theory, it could be that you can only identify the user in the Netflix database if his or her ratings are identical to his or her ratings on IMDb. Um, uh, yes, um, that's right. Um, this is pretty much uh, uh, what they did, right? Um, they're not, uh, so the issue was not um, that you could uh, identify, so let's phrase it the other way around. The issue was that uh, with auxiliary information, for example, the IMDb um, rating, which is a separate database that is not affiliated with Netflix, right? So uh, with a separate database with, uh, with separate data could identify you in, an, in a different set of data um, that is uh, in no way associated to the original data set. So the Netflix and IMDb um, data sets are, 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 are different, right? Two different companies. Um, and you're willing to share your IMDb account publicly, but you're not willing to share your Netflix recommendations publicly or your Netflix um, uh, ratings. At least um, that's the assumptions. In this case, you know, there's not really people hurt, right? Because it's just a movie database, but this is more a proof of concept. Um, and what this means is uh, um, not that, so the issue here is not that um, if you have the exact same um, recommendations or the exact same ratings on IMDb, as a Netflix database, that then you could be um, identified. But they are, uh, if they are similar enough, this is already enough to identify you in the in the Netflix database. Does this does this make sense? Does this answer your question? Okay, great. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I mean the Netflix uh, example is just a, a nice. Uh, proof of concept example, right? And nobody's harmed if they did it in any other, uh, I don't know, public health database uh, example. Um, there it's, uh, I'm not sure if uh, in the end, they were not the ones who were getting problems, right? So yeah, it's 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 great that this uh, was proven on a Netflix data set before it was proven uh, in anything serious. Okay, um, any more questions? Okay, so we we wait while uh, while we wait for people to type the questions if they have any. Um, after this, we are gonna um, go for a quick coffee break of fifteen minutes. Um, all the people who are still having uh, problems with the doc cancellation, which came up before in the chat, um, are free to to stay here, and we will try to to help them to fix the issues because. Um, uh, Docker and the setup instructions we provide in general are, of course, um, necessary for uh, um, the practical. 
are of course necessary for the practical um, part of this tutorial. Great, okay, so um, then uh, it seems like there are no more questions. Then we will uh, uh, go to a 15 minute coffee break and uh, try to start the next uh, talk at uh, in 15 minutes. Uh, I'm not sure what the, what your, uh, what it is in, in, in your time zone, but in, in my time zone, it is in 17, uh, 45. Okay. Okay. So still problems with, with Docker, but we will uh, try to fix this. Great. Then, uh, guys, see you in 15 minutes, uh, with the, uh, practical part of this tutorial. Thanks a lot for listening. Hi, uh, I hope you can see my screen and uh, hear my uh, voice. Uh, if there is a problem in that regard, please let me know. Uh, I hope uh, everybody is ready and here. Uh, we can start. In this part of the tutorial, we are going to talk about how, how to develop the data application. And we will be mainly focused on the official cloud platform. Uh, in general, we're going to talk about uh, what should you know about Feature Club platform uh, as a web developer uh, to develop uh, specific applications in a federated fashion. And then we are going to talk about how you can use uh, our free package to develop uh, apps uh, and how you can use our command line interface uh, to run your app and communicate uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the controller uh, to manage your uh, applications. And uh, at the end, we are going to talk about uh, the task that we uh, should tackle uh, this tutorial. First, about the platform. Uh, in general, the feature cloud the platform uh, as uh, a coordinator, which is one of the uh, hospitals or institutions who want to collaborate with each other to develop federated application, uh, to uh, create a project and ask other uh, institutions uh, to join, uh, to collaborate with train the model in a federated uh, fashion. And uh, once all the participants uh, join the project, uh, coordinator uh, starts the project and they can train a model. Uh, to, in, uh, the, uh, in a feature cloud platform, you can use uh, different apps, uh, including third party apps or uh, the apps that uh, you developed or uh, apps that are certified. And uh, these apps will be run in a workflow uh, in a linear fashion, uh, which means that uh, we have different uh, apps are running uh, in different clients. Once a specific uh, app is finished, the result will be forwarded uh, to the next app. And uh, this will be continued uh, until all the apps in the workflow are finished. Uh, different hospitals or institutions uh, who joined the, the, uh, the uh, collaboration, uh, they have their own data and they use their data uh, to train the model and share that model with the centralized custody, which is the coordinator uh, to aggregate the data or better to say models and uh, send back the models uh, to clients. Uh, in this manner, all the clients will receive the final uh, globally aggregated model which benefits uh, uh, every client. Uh, the workflow includes uh, different apps. And here we are going to mention that uh, how these apps uh, can be run. In this example, we have the first app from top, uh, which, uh, which is the cross validation apps. Uh, it receives the data of each client. Uh, in this picture, you will see the workflow running for two clients. One of them is coordinator, another is participant. Uh, the coordinator is responsible for aggregation. And first app uh, is cross validation app, so which gets the data and it splits it into three folds. And uh, the second app is normalization app. As you can see from this uh, arrow, uh, that uh, the normalization apps needs to get the local uh, statistics uh, to 
uh, calculate the global statistics and then uh, normalize the data uh, based on the global statistics. When the data, once the data is normalized, uh, the data will be passed to the second, uh, to the third app, uh, which is a classification app uh, here, and uh, there will be a model will be trained locally uh, to, to classify the data uh, for each fold. Uh, a separate model will be trained, and uh, the trained model will be uh, aggregated globally, and uh, this process can go for multiple communication runs. And once uh, the global model converged, the, the uh, final model uh, is ready to provide some prediction. And that prediction will be provided for the final app, which is a visualization app. And that visualization app uh, provides uh, some, uh, met uh, calculates some metrics and provides some visualization uh, to show that uh, how good uh, the workflow works. Uh, in general, in Future Cloud Platform, uh, we have the concept of app, uh, and we have an AI store that uh, includes some apps. Uh, app developers can publish their app uh, in the AI store by providing some uh, requirements, like uh, providing a readme file or a link to a GitHub repository uh, that makes it possible for everyone uh, to uh, read the code of the app. And AI store uh, is categorized based on uh, the app types. And we generally uh, categorize apps uh, into three uh, categories, uh, pre-processing apps, uh, like uh, normalization apps and class validation apps, analysis apps, uh, which are the apps related to, to some uh, data analysis, uh, like uh, classification, regression, uh, and uh, the third category is evaluation apps, uh, which are responsible to get the results of analysis apps uh, and uh, provides uh, some uh, visualizations uh, and uh, calculating some metrics to show that uh, how analysis apps uh, uh, performed on the data. Uh, the end users uh, can uh, access their uh, uh, desired apps uh, in the AI store uh, by uh, checking their uh, privacy level. Uh, for instance, apps can use uh, uh, differential privacy or secure multi-party computation uh, to advance the security of the apps. Uh, not all of apps are, are implemented based on the federated computations, as you can guess, uh, some of the pre-processing apps uh, are responsible to uh, do some local computation without communicating any data. Also, uh, end users can find out that uh, how uh, uh, is uh, rated by other users. And in this way, they can uh, assemble a workflow and put uh, desired apps in the workflow and use it. In general, uh, in Future Cloud, we have two types of uh, uh, users. Uh, end users uh, who are hospitals and institutions and uh, uh, app developers who are uh, want to develop apps and uh, provide the community with new apps uh, uh, that can solve their problems uh, for executing apps there are three uh, different ways and uh, and these uh, three different uh, way uh, are uh, Regarding the uh, type of type of the user uh, for app developers, we have test beds, uh, which is which makes it possible to run apps uh, in a standalone fashion. Uh, for every app developer, uh, it, it's important to find out that the app is working uh, regardless of the workflow, and uh, it can be used uh, to provide uh, the expected results. Uh, so they can use a test bed, which is available in the FisherCloud.ai website, and also uh, it's possible uh, to be accessed and used through the CLI. Also, we have a workflow, which is dedicated uh, for, uh, uh, which is intended to be mainly used by end users. Uh, 
uh, in this case, uh, hospitals or institutions who want to collaborate with the model. Uh, different apps uh, can be run in a workflow and uh, also app developers at some point need to test their apps in a workflow to, to be sure that uh, in different uh, workflows app can accept the results of uh, other apps and provide expected results uh, to the following apps. Uh, the workflow uh, uh, is initially designed based on uh, uh, linear execution of apps uh, in uh, running gaps uh, in a row. But uh, for nonlinear execution of apps uh, in a workflow, we have test workflow, uh, which is uh, really flexible and uh, is intended to, to be used by app developers who uh, don't want to implement all the apps, uh, don't implement every different aspects of the uh, app uh, by themselves, and they may want to, to try running different apps and doing arbitrary things uh, before passing the results of one app uh, to another app to get the desirable uh, results. In that case, they can use this workflow, and uh, it can be used through the uh, PIP package, uh, which includes uh, CLI. Uh, to execute apps in test beds, uh, you should uh, uh, go to the uh, fishingflow.ai website. There you should provide the name uh, for the image file. Uh, as previously mentioned, uh, we use dockerization and the app will be dockerized and uh, uh, will be run in a container. Uh, so you should provide the image name for the app that you want uh, to test. And uh, generally, because we are going to publish apps in Fisher Cloud AI uh, repository, uh, the app's name uh, will be it starts with Fisher Cloud AI prefix. You can run the app uh, for a couple of uh, for the for a number of uh, clients. Uh, for one client, uh, you can simulate the results uh, of the centralized uh, training. For one, one client, you can uh, run the app in a federated fashion. And if your app is running for 10 clients, uh, we can really say that it can be run uh, for more than 10 clients. But generally, uh, official cloud platform is designed to uh, tackle the uh, challenge of federated learning uh, in uh, cross silo platforms. Uh, uh, you should provide some data uh, for clients uh, because uh, you are not uh, running the app uh, in a real world scenario, you're just testing it. So you should have some test data and uh, you should put it in a specific directory uh, which is accessible uh, by the app. Uh, app is uh, completely uh, black to have access to internet and the data that app should use uh, to do its job uh, is provided in a specific directory and it, they, it, it will be uh, copied into the contenders space uh, to be accessible uh, for the app. And uh, in case that you have some data that is uh, generic and should be used by all the apps, like a config file, you can put it in uh, another directory uh, and uh, uh, provide the name of that directory in the generic directory section. Uh, there are a couple of other uh, <clears throat> other settings uh, for the test bed uh, that uh, you can use. Uh, for instance, uh, running your test bed on local channel or on the internet or the query interval uh, that helps uh, the controller find out how frequently you should refer to app to find out that uh, has something sh to share with other clients or not, uh, and that and uh, the results uh, should be saved uh, in the local machine, and you should provide a specific directory uh, which is visible for the controller. So controller find out that uh, okay, data is here. The, the, the result data can be uh, copied in that directory and be accessible for you. Uh, as I mentioned previously, uh, you should have some uh, general understanding of how platform works. Uh, and you don't need to know uh, about every detail, but uh, definitely at some point it helps uh, to know that uh, how platform works. Official uh, platform includes a packet which is implemented by Django and uh, has uh, and it stores the information about users, apps. Uh, 
and uh, developers uh, who develop apps, and uh, it's uh, connected to the front end and controller. Uh, in the front end, you can get some uh, uh, loggings and reports about the apps that are running, and or you can register uh, your app, uh, your your account, or uh, and also publish your apps there. There's a Docker registry uh, that stores all the Docker images of the apps, and uh, for every uh, participant, uh, there there be there will be some uh, some modules uh, that should be run. Uh, the most important one is the controller, which is uh, the only module uh, connected uh, to uh, backend and uh, have access to the internet. And uh, we have uh, app instance. Uh, which will be running uh, uh, and it's connected uh, mainly to the controller to get the data and send some requests uh, to data uh, to, uh, to the controller and uh, through the controller app, app instance can transfer data uh, to relay server uh, from relay server to uh, other controllers that are running on other clients and this is the way that uh, app instance can share data uh, with uh, other clients uh, Feature Cloud is a privacy by design platform, and uh, in this manner, we are going to guarantee that uh, apps cannot uh, reveal something that uh, are not intended uh, to be disclosed, and they cannot uh, do some malicious uh, acts. Uh, now that uh, we have uh, some understanding of the uh, platform, uh, we can start talk about. Uh, app development using Feature Cloud, uh, PIP package, uh, in general, uh, the Python library that we provided uh, and it's accessible uh, on, on the internet, uh, includes uh, three main uh, packages. Uh, the most important one is app package, which is useful for app developers. Uh, they can use app package, especially the engine sub package to implement apps. Uh, another package is the uh, API package, uh, which is good for uh, app developers uh, to uh, run the apps uh, using CLI and uh, find out that how good their app works. And uh, the last package is uh, workflow package, uh, which uh, makes it possible to use test workflow and run apps uh, in a non-linear non workflow. Uh, in the in engine sub package, uh, we have uh, two main classes app state class and app class. Uh, from the app class, uh, one instance uh, will be uh, instantiated, and that instance will be used uh, to register all the instances of uh, app state. Uh, and app state is the one that uh, carries out uh, all the operations and uh, communications between different apps. Uh, also, engine package includes some uh, roles, states, uh, operations, and things like that, uh, which uh, uh, which is shared among uh, different states and uh, can be changed during the app execution. Uh, to make it a little bit uh, more uh, uh, understandable, uh, we should talk about uh, 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 the relation between apps and the state. The app instance, uh, which is always the same and it's transparent and it's, it's instantiated uh, without uh, involvement of app developers. Uh, there are two main things happening. Uh, one is uh, shared memory uh, and another thing is uh, managing. But another thing is related to managing the controller. Uh, we can uh, define different states uh, to uh, execute different operations. Uh, in this example, uh, we have initial state. Uh, every app uh, should start with initial state and should end with terminal state. Uh, in the initial state, uh, you can define some operations uh, or just uh, uh, have a flow of to the following uh, states. Uh, and uh, in the following states, you can also have different uh, operations uh, being done. 
but in general, uh, these estates uh, are defined separately and they all uh, uh, subclass this app estate class. And, uh, and by defining the new estates, uh, these estates will be automatically instantiated and registered to this specific uh, instantiation, instantiation of the app class. So uh, they, they don't uh, uh, have any uh, shared memory uh, between each other and they, they cannot uh, communicate with the controller by themselves. So uh, they should uh, share data between each other uh, using uh, the app instance and uh, this uh, uh, shared memory is uh, provided by app instance uh, to be accessed by different uh, states. Uh, they can also uh, manage the app execution uh, through the app instance. And this execution can involve uh, different uh, data communication, uh, receiving or updating statuses, and uh, registering the states uh, or execution, executing the states. All these uh, operations uh, are categorized under managing the controller and uh, this uh, part of the app instance uh, is responsible to be in touch uh, with controller and uh, later we are going to discuss that uh, these interactions among the states uh, uh, can be done uh, in fairly transparent manner. Uh, in general, uh, we have some status in the app instance that can be used uh, by states. Uh, we are going to uh, categorize it in two levels. Of, uh, we have some statuses uh, that are uh, these statuses. Uh, all these statuses are shared uh, among uh, our same among the uh, states, and in different states, uh, uh, they can be changed. They can be checked and uh, or changed. Uh, and some of them are related to data communication. For instance, uh, once app wants to uh, uh, communicate some data to other clients uh, or other participants, uh, they should provide a signal to the controller that uh, says uh, there are some data to communicate. Uh, or once they wanted to communicate data, they should provide a destination. Uh, to other clients uh, that they want to communicate data or they can provide some uh, configuration for SMPC operations. And uh, also there are some other statuses uh, that are related to the end users uh, to signal the end user that uh, what, is the, what is going on in the app. Uh, for instance, they can signal the end user in the front end that okay, app execution is finished or uh, uh, provide some messages uh, or provide some progress level, uh, which is a number between uh, 0 and 1, to show that uh, how much of the app's job is done. Uh, in general, uh, every uh, participant that is running the, uh, every client that is uh, running the feature cloud platform can have a single uh, role, uh, and that role can be either coordinator or participant. For now, only one client can be coordinator, and the rest will be participant. The coordinator is the one that is uh, capable of uh, receiving the data of all the clients and the calling the specific communication methods to receive that data. And uh, once the app execution starts, uh, the role will be uh, the apps will be. Uh, inform that what is their role and based on their role they can uh, call different methods or, or uh, do different operations. These roles are important because we have a logic verification mechanism in place that makes sure makes sure that uh, you run the people uh, run the app in a specific uh, manner that you intended. Uh, uh, once you wanted to define an state, uh, you should mention that which roles are allowed to enter that state and once you want to uh, do the transition, uh, first you should uh, define uh, some transitions uh, 
uh, which uh, explicitly says that uh, which roles uh, are possible to transit from a specific state to another state. And once you want to uh, finish an state and do the transition, uh, uh, you should mention that uh, which uh, uh, state uh, you are going to. Uh, so it makes it uh, possible for us to check that uh, the logic that you uh, intended uh, is clearly stated in the uh, app's definition. Uh, different uh, states uh, uh, can be run uh, by different uh, roles. Uh, some states can be only run by coordinator, uh, some other only by participant, and uh, the third option is uh, running being run uh, by uh, all the roles, both participant and uh, coordinator. And uh, to do so, there are role tuples uh, that makes it possible for app developers to, to check that uh, the current role is eligible to uh, run a specific code inside the state or not. We also have uh, some uh, logs and operational states that makes it possible uh, for app developers uh, uh, to uh, signal the end user that uh, uh, the operational state of the app is running or uh, it's encountered an error or uh, required an action of, uh, from the user uh, in case that the app uh, is an interactive app. Uh, also, uh, developers can use different log levels uh, once they are going to uh, provide some logs in the front end for end user uh, to, to easily uh, show that uh, the app is uh, uh, encountered uh, an error uh, or it's, uh, the, the log level is fatal, which means that uh, the app encountered an error and it's not uh, recoverable. Found that error. <clears throat> and once uh, you want to implement different apps, uh, you implement different uh, states, and those states may need to share some memory. For instance, in this example, assume that in the initial state you are going to uh, read some data and you want uh, to. Uh, use that data in the next state, which is local computation state, uh, to train a model uh, and uh, to have access to that data that was uh, in the initial state. Uh, you can uh, use load and store method to have access to shared memory. So in the initial state, you can use a store method to assign a key uh, 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 to the data that you are going to store and store it, and later use that key in the local computation and use the load method uh, to retrieve that data from the shared memory. Uh, and uh, in this way, uh, uh, all the apps uh, you can implement uh, uh, In general, uh, we talked about the uh, feature cloud app class and uh, App class makes it uh, uh, possible to implement apps without uh, being obliged to know about uh, uh, how to interact with the controller. Uh, and you just need to know that uh, how, uh, for different purposes, which methods you should use uh, to uh, interact with the app class. And you don't need to register your states to the app class. It will be done automatically. You don't need to check your logic, uh, uh, it, it will be checked and reported automatically if, you, uh, if, your, logic, uh, if your logic is not uh, sound and uh, you are going from uh, states to another state that is not uh, declared in the registration. And uh, uh, this increases the, the transparency of uh, the app implementations. Uh, also, uh, it helps. Uh, also, app class helps uh, to provide logs uh, once you are going to execute apps. Uh, 
uh, and provide a shared memory uh, between different states uh, so you can uh, implement your uh, code in different classes and uh, not be uh, concerned about uh, how these classes can uh, share data with each other. Uh, in general, uh, we have uh, app state class uh, that we are going to be the call it a state here, uh, that which is an abstract class that, and includes uh, two abstract methods that should be implemented by you. Uh, one of them is uh, for registering transition and another is a run method which is responsible to uh, uh, do all the computation. And uh, a state class includes some communication methods that makes it possible to communicate data uh, across clients uh, or receive data from other clients. And uh, you should uh, mention uh, specific transitions uh, that is allowed uh, for different uh, roles uh, to be done in a specific app and you can update uh, local app uh, uh, local app status by update method and also you can configure uh, SMPC uh, module configurations one of the first things that uh, you should use uh, in app development is uh, checking uh, that uh, either the role of the app uh, once, uh, once it's executed is a coordinator or not. Uh, for that purpose, you can use this coordinator uh, method. Uh, it, just, it returns true if the uh, role of the app is coordinator and false. Otherwise, we can also check the ID of the uh, app instance or ID of all the clients once you are going to send data around it. Uh, if you want to know that, okay, data that you are receiving is from which client or is related to you or not, uh, to the current uh, app or not. Uh, to be clear, uh, once I say clients, uh, I mean institutions or hospitals who join the platform, uh, who join the collaboration to train a model in a federated fashion, which can have different roles. Uh, participant or coordinator. Uh, to define a custom state and uh, implement uh, uh, your uh, operations, uh, you should extend the app state class and uh, you should definitely assign the roles uh, to app state to the, uh, to the class uh, to make it clear that uh, which roles are eligible to enter the uh, state uh, uh, and also you should uh, define uh, transitions uh, uh, to make it clear that from this specific state uh, you can go to what other states uh, you can uh, transition uh, you can define transitions uh, without checking the role and you should do that because uh, until the moment uh, that app is executed uh, you don't know that uh, you don't know about the role of the app and uh, and the register method will be called before the app execution is started uh, by a uh, logic verification mechanism. So uh, be careful not check uh, the uh, app's role in the register method, just register all the uh, roles uh, that are meant to be taken in the state and later uh, in the run method, you can check the rule and take the transition that is suitable based on the rule. Uh, each state uh, have a, a unique name and that name uh, will be used in the transitions. And, uh, uh, and you can, uh, use uh, uh, different uh, serializations uh, uh, for sharing data across clients uh, once uh, you are going to define the uh, uh, states uh, you can use uh, json uh, for serializing data once you are 
sending out data using SMPC module and in other uh, cases uh, you can use people <coughs> once uh, you are going to extend the upper state class uh, you should know that uh, two abstract methods of register and plan should be implemented uh, in the register transition, as I mentioned before, register all the transitions, and uh, uh, in the run method, uh, at the right side, you can check different roles and do all operations that you want. You can provide some lagging, uh, some lags for uh, end users uh, that's watching the app execution in the front end. Uh, you can update the operational states for the end users or report the progress things like that. Uh, for communicating the data, which is uh, almost the most important aspect of the de developing federated apps, uh, we have uh, three methods available mainly for sending out the data, uh, for communicating data to uh, any other uh, Client, uh, you can use send data to participant method. Uh, it can be called by uh, all the uh, clients uh, regardless of the role, and it uses peer to peer communications. And you should provide some data and uh, destination, which is the uh, uh, idea of the clients that you are going to communicate to. Uh, you can also use a, a method send data to coordinator. Uh, as the name implies, uh, this method uh, doesn't ask for the destination, the destination is coordinator, and, uh, it's all, and only one client is, uh, has the role of the coordinator. You should provide the data, but you should mention that either you are going to use the SMPC module or not. In case you call this method uh, for coordinator itself, uh, you can uh, set the sent to self a uh, flag as true or false, uh, which, mean, which makes it clear that a uh, coordinator should expect uh, some data in its inbox uh, or not, uh, because uh, the, once it's called for the coordinator, it sends data to itself, which is not something uh, uh, that you want uh, in all cases. Uh, it depends on your uh, implementation. And uh, the last method is broadcast data, which is uh, only accessible for the coordinator, as the name implies. Uh, it broadcasts data across all the clients. Again, it, it, there is a send to self flag, which can be set to true or false. And uh, uh, if it's true, uh, the coordinator will uh, get the data in its uh, inbox. It's uh, important to mention in the uh, broadcast data method, uh, all the clients will receive uh, exactly the same data, same copy of the data in their inbox. And uh, it can be useful once you do the global aggregation and want to provide the uh, same uh, globally aggregated model for our clients. Uh, for receiving data from other clients, uh, there is a general method, uh, which is really flexible, but uh, it's a little bit complicated, complex uh, to deal with. Uh, this is Amit data method, which can be called uh, by any uh, client regardless of the role, and uh, it asks uh, for parameter n, uh, which mentions that uh, awaits for data of how many clients, how many pieces of data, each pieces of the data is uh, regarding the specific client. And uh, generally, we assume that if you are going to receive the data from different clients, that data has same shape, uh, but different values for different clients. <coughs> you can wait for one client or more. Uh, and there is an unwrap method, uh, which makes it uh, possible uh, to not uh, serialize, uh, deserialize the, the, data, the received data 
and they get the information about which clients uh, was the sender of the data. And uh, there is another uh, pool for data, uh, pool, uh, data pool interval uh, argument that makes, makes it possible to set a uh, couple uh, number of seconds that should be waited. Uh, sh uh, should the method wait uh, to receive data from other clients? At the end, it returns a list of the data, and uh, it can return a single. Uh, uh, data piece uh, we have uh, two simple uh, methods uh, to receive data from other clients uh, in most cases uh, these two uh, in our cases these uh, these two methods uh, should be used uh, by coordinator uh, it's allowed only for coordinator and uh, because only coordinator is uh, capable of uh, getting data from all the clients uh, and uh, one of them is uh, uh, gather data uh, which receives the data of all the clients uh, so it waits for uh, all the clients uh, so uh, once you are going to send data uh, to the coordinator and later you are going to use gather data method uh, make sure that uh, you are going to to wait uh, to receive the data for all clients, including the coordinator. So you should send out the data once you call, uh, send data to coordinator for the coordinator. Uh, I'm talking about uh, this uh, uh, send to self flag, uh, which should be set to true. So once you are going to call gather data method, uh, you see the data for the coordinator the other method is aggregate data, which is uh, a little bit more simpler, uh, simpler than gather data. It not only receives the data of all clients, but it takes care of the aggregating data to some extent. Uh, once you are going to uh, use SMPC module, uh, you will uh, receive one pieces of data uh, by calling aggregated data because SMPC module uh, 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 sums uh, up uh, the, uh, the received data and uh, save the shape of the data uh, for for uh, for all clients. For instance, if you send out a matrices of uh, dimension of ten and five, uh, for five clients you will have uh, five matrices. Uh, and if you use SMPC module, uh, you will receive uh, just one matrices of uh, matrix of uh, dimension. Uh, 10 to 5, and uh, the value is uh, summation of uh, all the uh, sent out uh, matrices. Uh, but if you're not using the SMPC module, uh, you will receive the data of all uh, clients uh, differently. You will receive uh, five uh, matrices. So, uh, to avoid the confusion, uh, you can call aggregate data. Uh, if the SMPC module is uh, used, uh, it automatically uh, uh, returns the data, but if it's not used, uh, it sums up the received data, the five matrices, and uh, sent back one matrix, and uh, you don't need to check uh, for the SMPC module uh, in case uh, you are going to use it or not use it. Uh, in different uh, executions, but it's not that uh, flexible. It's, it's a little bit as restricted. Uh, on the other hand, it's simple to use. Uh, here we, are, we have an example about simple uh, initial state. Uh, as I mentioned before, the first state. Uh, of every app should be initial state. Uh, we, we should uh, we should implement two method uh, register method and run method. Uh, register is uh, responsible uh, to uh, 
uh, introduce uh, transitions to other uh, states. Uh, each app should end uh, with terminal state. You don't need to implement terminal state, and you're not allowed to define a state and name it a terminal. Uh, terminal state uh, works like a flag uh, to make it clear that, uh, okay, the app execution is finished. Once you transition to terminal state, uh, uh, it means that uh, your app execution is finished. So uh, in this simple uh, example, in the register method, we register transition to terminal state. As you can guess, uh, you can see there is no talk of role here. Uh, by default, the role is both. So both roles are allowed to enter the initial state, and both roles are allowed to take the transition to terminal state. If you want to restrict it, you can restrict it in the, apps, uh, the, in the state's definition. You can also, you should also define a run method uh, and do any operation that is desired. Uh, but at the end, you should return the name of the uh, next state and that uh, next state should be defined in the register uh, uh, transition, uh, in the register uh, method. So uh, in this case, uh, terminal is the next state. We are going to do some transition here. And uh, this transition was uh, defined previously and uh, it, defines, it was defined for both roles. And uh, as you can see here, both roles are capable of uh, transitioning to terminal states. And once we run the app, uh, maybe uh, check the logic uh, using logic verification mechanism, uh, there will be no problem. Uh, you will receive no comment because the logic is sound. Uh, you intended to, to enter and go to terminal, and this is uh, what happens. Uh, every time you do, regardless of the operations that you are going to conduct in the run method. Uh, in this simple example, we just uh, print a hello world uh, statement uh, in the logs in the front end. One thing uh, that I didn't talk about is this helper function, uh, this app state, uh, app underlying state helper function. Uh, which should always put on top of the uh, uh, initial uh, uh, up of the above of the uh, class definitions, uh, which uh, provide which where you should provide the name uh, for your state. Uh, as you can see here, the name of the state is initial, and this state once the initial state class is instantiated, uh, that instance will be named initial and it will be used by the app, app class. So uh, here we have two names, uh, initial, which is the state's name, initial state, uh, uh, which is the name for the class. So not being confused, uh, this uh, name that we provided in app state, uh, app, uh, underlying state method uh, is uh, the important one, another, uh, the, uh, the name of the class uh, can be anything that you desire and it will not be checked. And once you import uh, uh, the file that contains uh, this uh, state, uh, it automatically uh, instantiates this state and uh, register it uh, to a specific app instance uh, that will be run later. Uh, now let's talk about uh, CLI, uh, which is a command line interface that we provided uh, in the PIP package and makes it possible uh, to uh, build your app, uh, create your app, and uh, publish it uh, or uh, run your app uh, in a test bed or test workflow. Uh, the first one is a feature called App New, which asks uh, for app name and template name, uh, template name is optional, uh, but app name uh, is mandatory. Uh, it's, it's also optional, uh, app name is also optional. Uh, once uh, you want to, once you uh, want to create an app, uh, uh, you need 
to have some specific files that are related uh, to the accusations and uh, to make it simple, uh, you just need to provide a name uh, for the file and in every directory that every path that you run this official cloud app new command <coughs> that directory will be created uh, which includes a specific file uh, sorry app name is not optional it's mandatory excuse me uh, you should provide the name uh, but the, 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 <coughs> the template is optional uh, it may have a different uh, uh, files included in your directory, but for now you don't need to be concerned about it. Uh, you can ignore this part and uh, just choose a name and the run feature cloud app new and uh, the name of the uh, app that you want. Uh, in this example, uh, we are going to use uh, FC test as the app name and uh, app blank. Uh, as the template name, and uh, as you can see, uh, a directory called fctest is uh, created, which includes uh, a Docker file, license, main, readme requirements, states, and some files inside a server config. Uh, the ones that you should be careful about is this main file and the states.py. Uh, the main file is the one that uh, yeah, import. Uh, the specific app instance uh, and uh, call uh, uh, methods uh, to provide an API for that app instance uh, to be connected uh, to the call, uh, controller and states uh, that uh, should be uh, implemented for your app uh, will be imported in the main file and uh, in that case uh, you have uh, implemented your app. Uh, you can also provide the README. Uh, also, it's important uh, to mention that uh, all the uh, Python libraries that you are going to use it should be named in requirement.txt. So once the Docker image is created, uh, all the libraries will be available uh, in the container, in the Docker image. The next uh, important comment in the CLI is special cloud app build. Uh, here uh, you should uh, provide an app name uh, uh, that uh, will be used for Docker image. Uh, here app name is optional. And uh, if you don't provide app name, uh, the name of the directory that contains the app uh, will be used for uh, the Docker image name. and. Uh, uh, just be careful that if later you are going to publish your app, uh, every app name should be started, should start with feature.ai uh, prefix, uh, which is at the address of our uh, Docker registry. Uh, once uh, you call feature.cloud app build and name of your app, uh, uh, it creates the Docker image and later you can publish it in the AI store. Uh, by calling feature cloud app publish, uh, and you should provide the name of the app, and you, should, you can also provide a tag for it. Uh, and in this way, you can uh, upload your uh, Docker image in our Docker uh, registry and makes it possible for others uh, to download the, that image and run it uh, locally in a workflow uh, or a testament uh, in a way that is desired by uh, others. Uh, uh, another uh, part of the CLI is about uh, running uh, test runs uh, in the testbed. Uh, as I mentioned previously, you can run apps in the testbed using uh, uh, front end uh, by providing some uh, details uh, about where the data can be found and uh, and uh, uh, what is what channel you are going to use things like that 
uh, and providing the name of the Docker image that you want to run. Uh, alternatively, you can use CLI, and CLI includes some commands. Uh, for instance, uh, you can use a start command uh, to run your app uh, in the tested or stop the test run that you that runs your app or uh, uh, gets the logs of the uh, app uh, app instance that you're running and uh, or also you can list the uh, list all the uh, instances of the app that you're running you can uh, delete uh, uh, the run and uh, get some info or uh, get some info about uh, traffic of the uh, app in the test bed. Uh, now it's time uh, for us uh, to develop uh, two apps. Uh, first, uh, it would be nice if you manage to run a simple Hello World application and later build upon it and uh, include more classes uh, uh, to have a mean app. Uh, in this case, mean app is uh, the one that receives uh, some number uh, from different clients and the coordinator average those numbers and broadcast uh, the average value to all clients. Uh, yeah, also we have a homework for you, uh, which can be, uh, can be discussed later. It's a little bit uh, uh, hard uh, to be tried now, but uh, if you uh, have some questions regarding the homework, uh, you can always ask us and join our Slack community and ask questions. The slides are available to you and you have access to the link to our Slack community, uh, please join and uh, we will be more than happy to answer your questions and help you to develop the related apps. Uh, thank you. And uh, I guess uh, now uh, we are going to uh, uh, develop uh, the Hello World app uh, in next uh, five to 10 minutes and spend the rest of the time to develop uh, mean app and make sure that uh, you can all you can implement federated apps. Questions, please. Unfortunately, I can't see any questions. If if there are any questions, uh... no, there are none. Is that any question? So that you can just screen share and show. Um, Okay, uh, if there are any questions, please ask. If not, uh, yeah, there are some questions now, or one question in the chat. Basically, if you will show this on your screen, and maybe it's a good idea if you show this hello world maybe on your screen, and then they can try to extend it to a federated team app so everyone knows how to get started. Great. Uh, 
Yep, I will do that. Uh, I hope you can see uh, my screen now. Uh, I'm in this directory and I want to create a new app. Uh, I will open the terminal in this directory and type feature cloud. Uh, make sure that you install feature cloud. By people install feature cloud. Uh, it can be done like this. And uh, yeah, here it's uh, installed. Uh, so now we can uh, start developing apps. I'm going to use feature cloud app new command and I provide some name. Uh, I will call it FC test uh, here. Yes, I get this the message path to your apps. Uh, it creates an FC test in this Python project app. Uh, directory and uh, messages in June. So uh, I will check FC test. Yeah, it's created. It's here. Uh, I will check the content. Uh, as I mentioned, as I showed previously, we have states and we have main file. Uh, let's uh, take a look into the main file. Uh, uh, here uh, it imports uh, some files and does some. Uh, Binding uh, with button, but you don't need to do anything about it. You just make sure that uh, make sure to import all the states that you implemented previously. Uh, and in this case, all the states implemented in the states file uh, and it's imported here. Uh, alternatively, you can implement the states directly in the main file. It's up to you. Uh, now uh, uh, we are going to check uh, app state uh, uh, states that provide file. Uh, as you can see here, uh, it includes uh, initial state and uh, doesn't do anything in a specific. In import, it imports app state class, which uh, we should extend uh, to uh, implement new states. It includes uh, app underline state uh, method uh, to provide the name initial for the first state, and uh, that state is defined here, which ex extends the app state uh, class, uh, and it implements uh, two methods: uh, it implements a register method uh, to uh, to define the transition uh, in terminal. Uh, it's to terminal state uh, and uh, it can be uh, done by both the states uh, and it has a run method uh, to do all the calculation uh, simply you should uh, provide some message uh, and in this case it's hello world and uh, yeah I save the file, and this is the Hello World app. It's implemented. You can do other uh, stuff here. You can record more things, or you can broadcast data, things like that, uh, to make sure that it works. Uh, I need to uh, build the app, Visual Cloud. View. Okay, uh, as I mentioned previously, you can provide a name, uh, or if you don't provide a name, uh, the name of the directory will be used to build the app. I uh, press enter here. Sorry, one moment. I guess I'm, oh, I'm not in the 
current directory uh, I was in another directory that was the problem I will open this directory make sure you're in the same directory that includes your app uh, it was looking for the Docker file and it wasn't provided in this Python project directory it's in fc underline test directory so I will run the same command I hope uh, my screen is visible and you can see I will not provide any name and uh, it, uh, by default uses fc test uh, to make sure that uh, uh, the Docker image is created. You can use uh, Docker PS command. Uh, sorry, Docker images command. Uh, in my case, it includes too many images, uh, but uh, at the top, you can see FC test, with the, uh, which is the name of the Docker image and the tag, which is latest and some ID, and it was created 18 seconds ago, and the size, which is 1.1 gigabytes. Uh, so, uh, it's, uh, it's there to be run. Uh, we need to, uh, another thing that we need to do is make sure that the feature cloud uh, controller uh, Uh, is running so I run Fisher Cloud Controller start. Okay, Fisher Cloud Controller is running, and to make sure that it's really running, and you hook up, you can check Docker PS. Yes, uh, it shows that uh, the Docker image named FC underline controller is running, and it's running for last 10 uh, seconds. Uh, now the next next job can be uh, uh, running it, running the app uh, in the front end. Please go to featurecloud.ai and make sure that uh, you registered previously. And uh, you should go to the testing for developers to testing part, and there you can create a new app. Uh, uh, you should provide a name, MC test. In this case, you can run it for any number of uh, clients that you want. You don't need to provide a path to the data because you are not going to read any data. But make sure that uh, make sure that uh, if you provide some path, the path exists. If the path doesn't exist, uh, you will get an error because uh, it looks for the app to provide the content. If, uh, the directory exists. If the directory doesn't exist, you will uh, end up receiving an error uh, because it, it looks for the controller root, looks for the directory uh, uh, to provide the content of that directory uh, for the app as an input data. Uh, yeah, but you don't need to uh, be worried about. Uh, 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 where the data should be saved, yeah, you can provide a path and uh, the directory will be created by controller, uh, doesn't need to be exist uh, previously. Now we are ready to run the app, we have the image created, if the underline test, we push the start button. Now the app is running, uh, there are logs for app provided here, and we are going to yes. because I edited the file uh, that caused some problem. Okay, 
I think some of the first problems to run the controller and also the app. Karu, um, yeah, the locks look, look fine, I guess. Uh, there's a <laughs> really odd problem with the tab and uh, I will manage it in a second. Sorry for inconvenience. Other participants, were you able to run the feature cloud controller? Yes, it's running. Feature cloud controller is running without any problem. Yeah, for you, yes, Mohammed, but for the other participants. Oh, there are some some people have trouble. Yeah, I'm just that. checking checking with them. If, if oh, thank you. Uh, I'm really sorry for inconvenience. Uh, I made two mistakes. But uh, please do not. Uh, uh, run feature uh, feature cloud controller uh, in the directory that includes your file. It adds the data directory uh, that is a little bit problematic and uh, that can cause a problem. Uh, please do not run feature uh, controller uh, in the directory. For instance, if I run feature cloud controller here. The data directory will be created automatically inside here, and later it will be referred to get the data, and uh, that that causes a problem. And be careful about a simple uh, uh, inventing and <laughs> using tabs. So this is the app that uh, we have uh, uh, in the. Directory, we are going to call feature cloud app build and build the app. And uh, and in the test bed, uh, we are going to create a new test run, provide the name, hit the start button. And it's running and transitioning to terminal state. And before transitioning to terminal state, it provides a, a login which says hello world. Uh, from the log, you can say you can find out about the log level, which is info, and you can find out that the log is provided in the initial state. And the, the log is hello world. And uh, you can also see the same uh, for two clients. Also for the other clients, you will see the same results. <clears throat> Hello, board. I hope you all managed to run it. But uh, be careful not to run Fisher Cloud uh, controller in the same directory that you are running. Uh, you will create the app uh, because it creates this data directory. Uh, which will be used uh, by the controller later uh, once you define the test run. Uh, let's take a close look here. The directory that it looks for data is feature cloud. It's here in this directory. Uh, and we can specify a subdirectory uh, which includes the data for this specific app. But uh, initially it looks here, and uh, if you run the uh, controller inside the directory that uh, you created your app, the data will be there, and that causes cause problem. Okay, uh, now the job uh, for Hello World app is done. Uh, if you manage to run the app, uh, you can use the initial state uh, to uh, generate a number uh, or uh, send out a fixed number. I suggest you uh, import NumPy and generate the number
and uh, send that number uh, to other clients and receive that uh, the data that sent out in the initial state in another state uh, which can be easily defined by copy and pasting it's not a hard work but be careful about the names And um, be careful about transitions that you are going to transition to that following state and uh, get the data in the global aggregation state, uh, average the data, and then broadcast it to another state, uh, which again can be easily defined by copy and pasting. Uh, for instance, let's call it right result. And receive the data here. And uh, show in each client that the global uh, mean is received and uh, it's available. Uh, as you can guess, it's not complete. You should take care of the roles. For instance, uh, this aggregating data, receiving the data of all clients is not something that is supposed to, do, to be done by participants. Uh, it's available for a coordinator. So uh, you should uh, uh, import roles and uh, well, you should uh, define the role uh, that is uh, allowed to enter global aggregation state or any name that you're going to use for that state and uh, use that role for transition and other things like that. Please make sure that uh, you use, you import the role and use it uh, in the right manner. Uh, before moving to the to this uh, meetup, uh, let's uh, check out that uh, everyone is uh, doing well with the uh, with running the Hello World app. Uh, any updates? Yep. Uh, Mohammed, sorry um, for interrupting, but I think we need to move to the next session now. Um, I hope most of you participants managed to run the Hello World app. If not, uh, Mohammed will uh, push the or upload the necessary files and so on to our GitHub repository that you should have access to. So you can compare and uh, you can compare your code with the solution basically later. Um, so we will move now to the next part of the tutorial and the last session. Um, I'll share my screen. So, yeah. Which is basically applying the federated learning on geographically distributed data sets. So for now you learned the um, theoretical background about federated learning and privacy enhancing techniques. And you got a short introduction about how you can develop a federated app in, in Feature Cloud or a federated algorithm. And now I want to show you how you can actually uh, train a federated machine learning with Feature Cloud. Um, so in, in general, we have the centralized machine learning where you train a model on a computer or a cloud and the data is stored centrally. Usually you don't only have the model, but you have a whole pipeline which you use to train this machine learning model, for example, consisting of a cross-validation normalization, then some kind of model training, a survival uh, and a support vector machine or a random forest, and you evaluate the whole 
pipeline. And in centralized machine learning, this is pretty straightforward. For example, using the scikit-learn Python package, this needs around uh, about three, three lines of code. So you load some data, you create a pipeline, and then you cross-validate this pipeline um, with some kind of scoring metric, the accuracy or here the area under the rock curve. In federated machine learning, as you already heard, this is a bit more complex. We have various clients with different operating systems, different machines. The data is uh, geographically distributed and we have an aggregation server that needs to aggregate uh, parameters that, that are exchanged. So we have a much more complex infrastructure for federated machine learning. And this is also something we wanted to solve with Feature Cloud. So we, sp we split Feature Cloud basically into a developer part. So developers that know to code can implement federated apps and uh, clinicians or biologists or people without programming knowledge can still train machine learning models in a federated fashion with Feature Cloud. Yeah, so I'll, I'll speed up this a little because we are, um, uh, yeah, we are a bit late in time. And in Feature Cloud, basically, we also offer running federated workflows. So which is basically a sequence of apps that do federated calculations. And um, you can do this like this. So at first, we need a coordinator, someone who creates a Feature Cloud project then assembles the workflow out of different uh, federated learning apps. Uh, then this coordinator invites other participants to the uh, computation. These participants can join the project with a specific token, and then the whole federated workflow can be started. And in this federated workflow, you have the input data from each participant. Then the first app calculates an intermediate results on this distributed data. And the result of the first federated app will be the input of the second federated learning app in the workflow. And by this, in the end, you get a global federated model and can evaluate this um, in feature cloud, basically. So the, the apps uh, that uh, developers can, can uh, produce in Feature Cloud uh, are uh, bundled in, in our AI store. So there we already have a bunch of different uh, federated learning apps, like uh, we support cross-validation. We have some pre-processing apps. We have uh, machine learning models for classification, regression, or survival analysis. And we have some evaluation apps that you can use to evaluate the the whole uh, model. And uh, to adjust these apps uh, to your own purposes, we have uh, uh, each app expects a configuration file where you can like configure how is your, uh, how is the name of your training data? Uh, how is the name of your testing data? Um, in the cross validation, for example, how many uh, folds do you want for the cross validation? And you can uh, adjust some hyperparameters of the machine learning models. So in the end, what each participant needs to to has have as an input for the federated learning workflow is the input data and a config file explaining that data and uh, and uh, adjusting the algorithm to, to their needs. So here we also have a small hands-on task where you sh uh, should run a federated uh, workflow in Feature Cloud. Um, so the data is basically a diagnosed classification of breast cancer, malignant versus benign. And the workflow consists of a cross-validation, a normalization, a logistic regression for classification and the evaluation in the end. And these are also the feature cloud apps you should use and assemble to a workflow. Um, so the hands-on tasks, you, you should have about 25 minutes now for this. Um, 
So I will try to split you into separate breakout rooms such that you can try a federated uh, model training in smaller groups. And uh, for this, you first should create a feature cloud, a cloud account on our website and create a site. And then you choose a person as the coordinator. You need to run Docker and the feature cloud controller. Um, this. Uh, like similar as it was written in the setup instructions. I hope uh, Docker now runs for everyone and the feature cloud controller. And then the coordinator creates a project, assembles a workflow and invites other the other participants of the breakout room. And then uh, the coordinator and the invited participants uh, um, exactly choose the data, which is also in the GitHub repository, create the config files. They are also already provided in the uh, repository and then add them to the, to the feature cloud project. And in the end, when every participant pent uploaded uh, its data, his data, the coordinator can start the workflow. Exactly. So, um, do you have any question questions about this already? It doesn't seem so. So then I would try to split you into smaller groups and then each of us, uh, will help the individual group to set this up. Um, let's see if this works. It says it's creating the breakout rooms, yes. Okay, Julian? Are you still there, Mohammed? Yes. Okay, then I, I would suggest I um, visit breakout zero and you breakout one. And Mohammed, you can also join either of them. Um, sure. Can what you see the breakout tracking? rooms? Um, on the top now, there is uh, representatives are currently in breakouts. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. No? Unfortunately not. So, can you see my screen? Oh, yes. Weird. <laughs> so, here? No, we don't see, uh, so I don't see that. Okay. Neither. Okay, then I will just uh, switch between the breakout rooms and try. I guess they can hear us, or they are in the breakout rooms. They can't hear us. I don't know. Uh, provided everyone's in a breakout room, they can't hear us, I guess. I guess so. Uh, yeah, uh, for the app developments, I guess we should uh, ask them to join this Slack channel and ask questions there. And we can help them to develop apps. Because there are little things that yeah, so the pip command also doesn't doesn't seem to work properly. The start controller command, but we already know this from the hackathon. Right? Uh, it works. Uh, the start controller command works. Control, um, feature cloud controller start doesn't work for many people. I don't know why. For those for those who are using uh, Windows or not Windows, uh, especially virtual uh, machine inside the Windows they should probably uh, use uh, this script. Yeah, the script works usually, um, but the pip command doesn't. And we should just make sure that the pip command is as robust as script. Mm -hmm. I mean, in this case, we need to use the script as a fallback. Mm -hmm. Sorry, uh, everyone is back, I guess, because in the first breakout room, there was only one person. So I think we should maybe have one group here. And so maybe everyone who is 
uh, able to participate now in a federated calculation could shortly type something in the chat. I'm here or something. And then we can make one, uh, one federated calculation here in the, in the whole group. So Tarun is here earlier. Um, Cesare was here. Yeah. Um, Jade, did you manage? Yeah, Yoy is here. Okay. Three. Jade, uh, did you manage? Ojung? Okay, perfect. So then um, everyone who is here can now um, go to featurecloud.ai and maybe sign up with an email address and create an account and afterwards a site. Um, I can share my screen and maybe make it simultaneously such that you can see how this works. And if you have questions or it doesn't work, uh, let me know directly. So you, here's the sign up. So you can sign up with your email. Um, I just need to use an email I didn't use yet. Um, And you can also choose a role here and then sign up. Yeah, okay, this email is already. Um, okay, great. So you then should get a confirmation email, um, but I don't think you need to accept it right now. And then here is the message. You need to be assigned to a site in order to run federated workflows. You can create a new one. And so you can here write something, test site. Uh, you can leave the other uh, fields blank and add the site. Yeah. And then you can also see that the feature cloud controller is on here. Um, so maybe make sure that the feature cloud controller is running. Okay, the first account is created. Tarun, uh, could you also create a site and is your feature cloud controller running? Great, yeah, we will wait some minutes. Maybe for those who are using a virtual machine, um, you need to uh, enter the IP address of um, the machine in on the controller page. So, um, yeah, oh, wait, wait. Do you still see my screen? Yeah. yeah. So here you can go to the controller page, and for everyone who has the controller running locally, it should be localhost eight thousand, and everything should be green. And the ones who run the controller on a virtual machine, there should be something red here, like offline. And then you need to write the, the corresponding controller URL. Um, maybe Julian, you know which was the URL. Everything is green oh, for yeah. Tarun. Right? So you need to replace localhost with the IP address. So that, this is different for everyone, depending on where the yeah. Yeah, virtual machine is located. Okay. Okay, Cesar, Yayoi, Ho Jung, how, how is it going? Could you create an account? Can't run the controller. What's wrong, Ho Jung? Could, could you run it earlier uh, in the setup instructions? So if the pip command doesn't work for you, I share a link in the chat. Mm -hmm. 
and there you find two scripts. So when you go to getting started, um, so scroll a little down to getting started, and they under two you find install feature cloud controller, and there you find two scripts: an sh script and a bat script. So depending on your on your. It's also in the GitHub repository if you use the run uh, control run feature cloud script. Okay, so but uh, for two it worked, but they need to set the controller URL. So Yayoi and Cesare seem to have a virtual machine, I guess. Yes, just um, one. and Anna, I guess. Yeah. And I'm sorry if I mispronounce any names. <laughs> I, I try my best. I'm using Mac, okay, yeah, but um, this should still work. I'm also using, okay, everything is green now here. So for Ho Jung and Tarun, it works. So let's wait for the others. Uh, ya ya yoi. Um, so, uh, is the controller running? Did the script run run through? Also feel free if your mic works or your video, you can also join with your microphone and video that maybe makes things easier. Okay, but uh, Tarun, as you were the first, uh, you can already try to create a project and assemble the workflow we set uh, consisting of uh, the cross-validation app, the normalization app, the logistic regression app, and the evaluation classification app. And for this, at first, you need to go to the AI store and add the necessary apps uh, to your library. So. You can click on an app and then add it to the library. And when you edit the four apps, you can here go to projects and create such a project. And then you are the coordinator of that project. Cesare, uh, did it work for you now? Or do you still don't know the URL? It should be the IP address of the of the virtual machine, right? Or is it the local IP address? No. It should be the, the IP address of the virtual machine and it's still port 8000, should be. Mm -hmm. Tarun is here. Great. You are still muted in case you say something. Hi. Um, how do I know which apps uh, to add to my library? Can you hear me? Uh, we cannot hear you. But maybe then you can quickly type in the chat if you are setting up the project. Ah, we see you. Hi. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes, perfect. OK. How do I know which apps to um, add to my yeah. project? I can show them again here. So this is the workflow we want to implement. So we need the cross-validation app, the normalization app, the logistic regression app, and the evaluation classification app.
Cesare Yayoi Hojung, did it, did it work for you? Great. And then we wait for Tarun. Okay. Cesare, what's the problem? It doesn't uh, switch to online when you add the, the controller URL or? Um, if you switch the URL, don't forget to press set here. And um, this might be a problem. Okay. Tarun, you have all four apps added. That's good. So then you can here go to projects and create a project. Give it a name. I, just, I know what's the problem. I believe I know what's the problem. You need to allow mixed content for that website. So when you're on fitthecloud.ai website, um, you can click on the, the lock icon on the left of the address and then one sec you can click permissions for the site so in, in your respective language um, i guess and then it should be uh insecure content so the third last is it is for me and if you then choose allow it should work and the reason is that um, that it is HTTP, right? It's an HTTP connection, and to localhost that's fine. But if it's another website, it's locked by default. So I hope that was that was not too fast. Just let us know, Cesare, if you need additional help. Yeah. And Tarun. Uh... If you create the project and the workflow, it should look somehow like this. So the order, of course, is important uh, that the cross-validation is the first app because the somehow the cross-validation and the evaluation somehow wraps up the whole pipeline. And our pipeline is basically a normalization and logistic regression. And first, of course, we want to normalize the data and then apply the logistic regression. Just quickly, for those who are having issues with using the controller from a different IP address, I'll share my screen in parallel, and mm -hmm. then you can follow my screen. The others can still follow Yuli. Great, Tarun. Then uh, let's maybe wait until uh, Cesare fixed this problem. Okay, Yayoi, did you manage? Uh, you you only need the name of the site. You don't need to fill all the fields. Uh, so as soon as you created the site, and your controller here is green, then we would be ready to go for you. Somehow it's still red. Um, are you using Google Chrome? Yeah, Yoy. This is also important. Okay, great. And are you using, did, did you run the controller, the, the script that was provided in the GitHub repository, the start feature cloud script? Okay. So what you can do is you can always go to that address, right? So you can always go to this IP address and then it should say hello feature cloud. If, if that works, then it, it means that the controller is reachable from outside. If it's not working in here, then it means that your browser is somehow blocking the request. Maybe I can shortly show again 
um, the script. So basically when you cloned the GitHub repository or downloaded it, you downloaded it to some uh, directory. So for example, I have it here. And then in the material folder, we have the run feature cloud.sh. And basically you can run this script with sh run feature cloud, at least on Mac, um, on Ubuntu, it could be point slash run feature cloud or something. And yeah, then it pulls the current versions of the apps. Okay, you did that part, but it's still read in your browser, uh, the controller. And what does it say? Does it say offline or site not registered or Docker not available? Um, is there any any code? And can you can you um, do you see the hello feature cloud message if you directly enter this address in your browser? Okay, but we have Tarun, we have um, Ho Jung, it's working. Cesare, is it working now for you? Yeah, yeah, Tarun, you are fine. <laughs> when you manage to create the, the workflow and everything. Maybe we will give you still trying. Do not wait. Yeah, yeah, we will wait three more minutes and then uh, we will just uh, start the calculation with everyone who, who managed to set it up. Okay. Yeah, you all should use Google Chrome um, or some Google Chrome engine based browser. Okay, but Tarun, what you could do now is um, you created um, the project. Um, I'll just as an example also create one. So then you press finalize and then the, the project is created and you see here some details. You see the workflow here, the start button. You should not press it now, but at first invite other participants. So what you can do now is create a token here for someone else, copy the token and post it in our chat. And then maybe Ho Jung can try to join the project with this token. Yeah, great, there's a token. So Jung, you can copy this token, go to feature cloud to projects and press join and then enter this token. And Tarun, maybe you can create another token so I can also join the, the computation. Ah, can't do copy here. Yeah, me neither. That's of course. Uh, yeah, that's true. Copying is not possible. Okay, then we unfortunately need to type it. And please take the top one for Jung. I'll take the bottom one.
um, where to type it in. So here is the projects page. And then there is a join button and you press this join button and then you can enter the token there. And then you can press view and you see an overview of the of the workflow that was created which apps are included and then you can join the project julian i think we are seeing your chat instead of the other window oh okay <laughs> thanks for for letting me know um Okay, but Ho Jung, uh, could you still manage it? Can you now see the feature cloud page here? Yes. Yeah, okay, great. So here project, join, enter the token, press view, then you see an overview of the project and then you can press join project. And then you sh should see something like this here. Uh, then you took my token, so uh, please take the top token here, 055328, because I also joined with the bottom token. And Tarun, you should already see that I joined the the project. And as soon as Ho Jung joins, you should also see that name in the list. I see something called test site. Yeah, that's me. And Ho Jung also made it. Uh, so you should see three participants now. Okay. I have Wait, mine. Do you see that? I have mine and yours. I think Hojun is still joining. Okay. So Hojun, you uh, there is an overview page. So now you need to scroll down and press join pro join project or something like this, and then. Okay, I see him now. Okay, great. Is and this... now uh, Tarun, you can press start project. So. You, okay. you now start the project for all participants and then every participant um, can can choose the data. Yeah, here. So now this changed, the workflow was started and here is a field select data set. So what we do now is we choose a data set from the GitHub repository that you all cloned already and uh, I prepared several data sets here. So now we are three clients that participate in the study and there are three folders. So Tarun, you are client one. So you should choose the data file from client one. Ho Jung, you can choose the config file and data file from client, from client two and I'll choose uh, the files from client three here. So the folder would be the, our GitHub res, repository, ISMB tutorial, then materials, input, three clients, and then choose your corresponding client number. I'm client three now, so I choose the config file. 
and the data. And then I press upload, which is not an actual data upload because we don't send the data around, but um, it's kind of selected now for, for this calculation. And now I'm here waiting for all participants to upload their data sets. I think I took client one. Mm -hmm. Great. So Ho Jung, uh, you should take client two and uh, the data.csv file in that folder and the config.yaml file. Uh, it's important to have both. Now then, ah, okay, yeah, you need to choose all files uh, first. So um, maybe we can stop the workflow and try it again. And can you restart, Tarun? There should you should see another start button now. Okay, I started it again. Yeah. So it's important to first add the two files and then upload. But I agree, this is a bit misleading with the green upload button here. Uh, this is something we should change in the future. Oh, so I have to wait for everyone to upload. Yeah, exactly. Before I click that. Okay, I think it's my mistake. No, uh, you can already click upload. Uh, that's fine. But you need to add all files first and not upload them separately. So okay. you need the, the config file and the data file and then press upload. I got an error saying could not finalize upload. Oh, okay. Um, maybe let's try it once again. Otherwise, um, I will just show it on my computer. Can you uh, start it again, Tarun? Yeah. yeah. And now add the files and press upload. Ho Jung, you too again, please. For me, it worked with the upload. I, I got the same error. Okay, in, then. Invalid bound config for type bind. Okay, then let's, uh, then I will uh, quickly show it. So I'm sorry that this didn't work now. The, the setup uh, seemed to be more complicated here and only through the chat. Uh, I'll quickly show this as an example here. Um, so basically, here you would add other participants like we already did. And then you can start the workflow. Um, add your local files, upload them. Like I said, it's not a real upload. It's just uh, moves the files to the your local feature cloud controller who then handles the calculations. And uh, then it starts um, the calculation here. So we now see here what happens. We see a progress. Now the cross validations uh, splits the data into different folds that can then be um, evaluated in the end. Then the results of the cross validation now are the input of the normalization. So each fold gets normalized. 
After that, a logistic regression will be performed. And this logistic regression model then trained on the normalized model uh, inside a cross-validation will be evaluated finally the evaluation app, which provides different tricks. So we can have a look in a second um, on, on the, the results of this. So this is happening um, for everyone's data set separately now. Exactly. Um, yeah, so basically uh, your local data set, so there are calculations on your local data set, and then each app uh, transmits the private parameters to, to one aggregator instance and uh, um, aggregates the model parameters, for example, of the logistic regression in each iteration, such that it results in a global model in the end. And in the case of logistic regression, this is really the an equal model as it as it would be when all data is, uh, is stored on a central place. So each single app has a data exchange, basically, of the model parameters. And here we now see the whole workflow uh, was uh, uh, completed. Then I can download the results and I see how good my model performed in the CSV file. So here, for example, I have an accuracy uh, for each cross-validation fold. So usually you would take the mean and the mean here would be around 0 0.89 or something. And it provides different scores. And by this, you can train a machine learning model here in Feature Cloud on distributed data. Unfortunately, now for us three, it didn't work because we had some setup problems. Um, this is, of course, always tricky in such a live tutorial session um, if we cannot really plan the whole project. Um, but I hope you got an idea of, of this and how this should work. Basically, if Docker runs and uh, the data is selected carefully and so on. And yeah, just uh, for completeness, um, I also wanted to show you some other federated frameworks that could be interesting for you. So in Feature Cloud, we basically tried to split the development and the execution part such that it can also be executed by people with less programming knowledge. This is why we have this uh, nice front end and reduce the complexity. Um, other federated frameworks um, are more concentrated on like developing and implementing and coding. For example, Open Mind uh, is the hugest community for federated and private um, neural networks, I would say. Um, so they have the package PySift, which could be interested if you are mainly interested in deep learning. So this is a huge community. Then there is a package called Flower, the friendly federated learning framework, which also supports an easy setup for federated learning. And it provides a... Um, a layer on top of scikit-learn, which is a famous uh, machine learning framework. So you can basically federate the scikit-learn uh, methods and models. And another one, which is for uh, basically developed for mobile phones is Xenet. And for example, the privacy preserving uh, Google competition Xen is based on this Xenet open source framework. I just wanted to show you this uh, for completeness. So there are also other frameworks out there. Um, we concentrated in Feature Cloud to make it as easy as possible and reduce the development complexity through this AI store and so on. So developers still need to develop the federated algorithms, but in the end, everyone should be able to use it. Yeah, and with this, I would uh, close this session. So now we have five minutes left for some questions and it would be nice to fill out the feedback form um, such that we can enhance some things for the next time. So obviously now uh, the setup didn't work for a lot of you guys. We hope that 
uh, sending the setup instructions up front uh, could uh, solve most of the issues, but apparently um, we should have really fixed that before. And uh, yeah, so fixing it online now was, was a bit too tricky. Uh, 